Hi, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Wherever you find us, whether it's a video or podcast on your favorite platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the videos or MP3 files, which you can download and enjoy without commercial interruptions. If you're into classic horror, ghost, and adventure stories, I narrate Nightshade Diary, and you can find links at NightshadeDiary.com. If scary stories are your bag, and listening to encounters with cryptids, ghosts, dogmen, and other weird creatures sends a shiver up your spine, then go to SupernaturalStoryTime.com for links to our weekly podcasts. Noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird can be found at eerie.news or visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Please subscribe to my newsletter on Substack. Just go to mppelliser.com for a link. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. I know even though this show's a little bit staggered, it's still we're in the new year, so happy new year, everybody. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and happy new year yippee we made it to a new year and of course like i said before we have to get used to writing the 24 now instead of 23 everybody wants to date everything the past year it takes a while to get over that uh but yeah you know everybody asks me how's the weather in florida but northern florida it's been cold but remember it's cold for me no matter what if it's below 50 i think it's cold but no it's been uh it's been dropping into the 40s and high 30s at night and yes, and I've got my chickens. They, I've got heat lamps in the coop in there. And um, I've got some, all the birds. I got some birds in here. And the ones that are a little bit hardier, they, everybody's got a heater. Because even though you read that, you know, some of these birds, they can withstand pretty cold temperatures. I I, I can't do that. Uh, I, I, I'm, if I'm cold, it's like, I don't have, I can't do that. So yeah, they got their little heater thing going on. And so yeah, it's uh it's been it's been cool out here, which is nice by the way. It's nice. You know, it's like everything. When you're in the summer and you're sweating buckets, it's like, oh my God, can't wait till winter. And then when it's winter and you don't want to go out there unless you like run out and run back in, it's like, oh my God, in the summer, it's like, you know, that's the that's the human condition kind of thing. But besides that, everything is good. I'm I've got high I know people have asked me if I'm going to do something for the New Year's resolution, for the hypnosis, for not even the hypnosis, for people just like you know, but the last one, I think I did it like three years ago. Like, uh, are you going to talk about, you know, people, the do's and don'ts of the New Year's resolution and, you know, how we kind of like crash and burn by design kind of deal? Yes, I am going to do one. I just have to sit here and put some material together that's different from the prior one. All right. Um, just so, and you know what? It's really funny because my husband, he goes to a gym and he was telling me, he says, oh, we've got a bunch of new people. Because after a while, you get the regulars that have been going there all along. And he's telling me, yeah, we've got a bunch of new people. You could tell that, you know, this was their New Year resolution was to go to the gym, you know, or, you know, work out, whatever. And it's not even because they're overweight. It's just sometimes, it's sometimes it's a weight problem. Sometimes it's that, hey, this is the year that I'm going to get that body, the beach body by the time I summer rolls around and I told him, I told him, I need you to check every once in a while and see who sticks it out because we have like a, a running bet on that, but let's see what happens. <laughs> but anyway, let's get on to the good part. The good part is the guest that's here tonight at stories of the supernatural. This is the first time this gentleman is here. His name is Martin Powell. He has written hundreds of stories, both for comics and prose in numerous genres for Disney, Marvel, DC, dark horse, capstone books, and Edgar Rice Burroughs Inc. among many others. Nominated for the prestigious Eisner Award for his fiction featuring Sherlock Holmes, he has written many of the most popular characters in the industry, including Superman, Batman, Popeye the Sailor, Dracula, Frankenstein, and Tarzan of the Apes. His tall tale of Paul Bunyan won the National Moonbeam Golden Award for Best Children's Graphic Novel of 2010. He's pioneered the retelling of classic fairy tales with a freshly relevant 21st century spin. For such critically acclaimed children's books as Red Riding Hood, The Ugly Duckling, Rapunzel vs. Frankenstein, and many more, Powell wrote the fan-favorite sci-fi comedy adventure Mars Attacks Popeye, and he is the creator of The Halloween Legion, a nominee for the Stanley Excelsior Award. He's also been an educational writer for Gander Publishing dedicated to improving literacy 
reading skills for students of all ages. Currently, he's the author of nearly a dozen different Edgar Rice Burroughs weekly online comic strip series and the critically acclaimed Jungle Tales of Tarzan graphic novel. In 2017, he received the coveted Golden Lion Award from the Burroughs Bibliophiles for his ongoing contributions to the legacy of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Help me welcome him. How are you doing today, Martin? I'm doing well. I'm I'm a little cold like you are. It's cold here too. No, well, you know, I, I, everybody knows I'm a whip. I'm a weather whip. You know, I was born and raised in Miami and I moved up to Northern Florida. And obviously it doesn't snow here, but you know, I, I, cold to me is like, oh my God, like, I'm not kidding you. Below 50 is like, it's an Arctic weather kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, it's uh, like I said, you know, when I'm, when it's hot in the summer, I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait till winter comes around. Uh, you know, that's that kind of thing. Nowadays, it's like in the mornings to go feed my animals. I run, I, I put a jacket over my PJs and I run out there and it's like, Hey guys, here's your food. I'll be back later. <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> bet. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I that's the one thing though, uh, uh, for my animals, because everybody knows I'm a pushover. I, if I'm thinking if I had to be cold and hungry, no, I better go feed them. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So let me ask you, you, um, it's so, when you mentioned that thing about literacy, where, were you, I'm, I'm going to ask if you're just like me, where as a kid, you were a reader. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, very much so. Yes. Um, in fact, um, I remember once, I think it was in maybe sixth grade, the teacher mm -hmm. did a little, uh, played a little game where everybody was supposed to, um, write a single word description of each of us in the class. Okay. And the one that I got back from everybody was reads. <laughs> okay. So it was a consensus, right? It's like, and so that was the impression that I made on everybody, I guess. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's yeah. worse. I tell everybody, yeah. It's, <laughs> you know, that was, I, I remember um, I was growing up, the library was a John F. Kennedy library. It was a big library. And, you know, they had uh, the kids section and by second grade, I was like already like, you know, actually reading, reading. Sure. And I remember I would make, I drag my mom to take me, you know, they would let you only take out 10 books. And, you know, I, I went through that kid section pretty quick, which was mostly the dinosaurs and, you know, and things like that. But yeah, to me, I was one of those that I was, I would sit down to eat dinner and I wanted to read it. My mom was like, put that book away, you know, or stuff <laughs> like that. It was like, no, for me reading, it was not a chore. You would tell other people read. It's like, what? Uh, you have to yeah. read that. I was like, well, it was, you know, as, as for me as a kid, it was, a you know, kind of a, a safe escape, you know, just from from whatever was going on at the time, you know. And right. And, and it um, makes your imagination. It makes your, it gets sure. your imagination like create. This yeah, was, absolutely. Uh, you know, absolutely. The, the, and, the, you know, but, you know, usually it's like you're reading the words. So it's everything that the, the movie is running on up here. Right. Well, yeah. And, and plus, when I was a kid. Um, you know, you could find you know comics and paperbacks with yes. pocket change. And yes, it was cheap, yes. It was cheap entertainment, you know, and and you could it it keep you busy all day long, you know, sure. if not more so. So yeah. that was the thing to do in those days. I still I still do it, you know. I mean, I haven't changed sure. in that regard. I have my wife and I have a a, a personal library here at home, and it's probably got ten thousand books in it, probably. You know what? Um, I had to. When you move around, I let go of a lot of my books. But hold on, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna show something real quick. Hold on. Okay. Oh, and it just where did I do it? Oh no, they're over there. Yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. Well, anyway, the other day I went to because over here where I'm at, they don't have pickup delivery. We have like a recycling dump site. It's like about a block and a half. Every time people don't want stuff, they'll just put it there, like not trash. Hey, if anybody wants to take it, take it. That kind of deal. Right. Somebody left three books of western paperbacks and i said oh. my husband looked at me and he goes do you want to go oh yeah and he's like and i've got the bags over here they're still like i'm i'm like uh pulling them out little by little which one is this see here's one of these ambush ambush of the mountain man okay and you know what i i besides lewis lamore i hadn't really written uh read them any western so i was like i'm gonna immerse myself in this western stuff you know because i really like lewis lamore no, yeah, my dad right. was a big Western fan. I used to get uh, Western books from the library from him all the time. Uh -huh. uh, I couldn't. It, it's only the only thing I'd ever saw him read beside the newspaper. You know, so. right? Oh, well, yeah, that was, it was a newspaper, actually a newspaper. Yeah. You know, because that's gone by the wayside. Um, but yeah, uh, 
it, that's one of the things that, and, and I know you mentioned it in your bio about literacy for kids, mm-hmm. where it's like, let me tell you something, not because I did it on purpose, but when you read, everything improves your vocabulary, your writing, everything. You, it helps a lot. It does. It rewires your brain. Yes. You know, so and, w- um, when when did you decide, hey, I'm going to start writing? You, This is my thing. Well, I, I wrote my first book in second grade. Oh, sh- okay. You- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, that was, pr- it's pretty much always what I've wanted to do. I've always wanted okay. to tell stories. Although mm-hmm. my formal education is actually in paleontology. Really? So I, I went in that direction too. Okay. Um, and just started selling stories to the point where I, I thought, well, I guess this is what I'm supposed to do then. Sorry, and dinosaurs. So, um, yeah, I never really gave that up. I mean, I've worked in museums and things, yeah, but I never okay. really gave it up. I it's it's still something I'm interested in, you know, as a as an amateur, you know, on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, just like the paranormal stuff too. It's a similar, it's a similar right? Exactly. Situation. But the, the your first love is the writing. Yeah, it, it, I I think what it was is is I I realized early on that um, you know stories make us feel things, and you can actually make somebody feel something if they want to or not, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. It's like you can manipulate emotions and make people think things that they wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And it was a kind of um, almost like a magic trick in a way I, mm-hmm. I felt, you know, and, um, and it, it is rather, I mean, good, good writing, especially if you're writing mysteries, it's all about misdirection. It's very much a magic trick. Yes. Um, yes. So um, that's, that's what I, I got into doing. Um, I didn't seriously start to, um, to write until I was about 19, as far as okay. deciding, okay, I think this is what I want to do. And right around that same time, I was lucky enough that I met Ray Bradbury. And, oh my uh, God, you met Ray Bradbury? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was like a, well, certainly a mentor to me, but kind of like a second yes. father too. And oh my he, God. Um, wow. he was extremely, extremely supportive. You know, in fact, mm-hmm. at that particular time in my life, he was the only person in my life that was supportive of what I was doing. The only really? one for years. And uh, man, that, and talk he, about a mentor. Wow. Oh, he was an amazing fellow. I miss him very much. He, uh, he would call me at like at midnight sometimes. And we would talk about things like King Kong and Phantom of the Opera, you know? <laughs> so, Let me ask you something. Is it true? And I'm going to ask you, I'm going to assume it's true that he did a lot of his self-education at the library. Absolutely was- true. He, uh, yes, he, his, he always said that his family was too poor to send him to mm-hmm. college. And so uh, when they moved to Los Angeles, he had access to the library there, which is, you know, quite a vast library. Uh-huh. And he uh, I think he said this was after high school. And I believe he told me that he uh, went to the library every single day for I think he said 10 years. There you and go. then he graduated from the library the way he felt. And he read in every subject that he could find. You know, wow. He was extremely well read. Ray was. Yes. Uh, I mean, he could quote things like his favorite was George Bernard Shaw. And he could quote him like you wouldn't believe. I mean, pages and pages of quotes just from out of his head. Wow. You know, so the um, librarians yeah. there must have said, hey, yeah. <laughs> hey, Ray, <laughs> how, you, how, you, how you doing today? I mean, that's incredible. But yeah, let me tell you something that shows you as far as education, when you have a willingness, mm-hmm. what you can actually do. Right. If you have no yeah, choice. It was, just, it was just pure will, you know, that's what he did. Mm-hmm. And he always, and at the time I was, I was in college when I, when we were, um, when we were connected in that way. And he, um, he was always telling me, you know, he says that, you know, you know, <laughs> that college can't teach you how to write, you know, that, right. <laughs> and I, you know, and I was like, well, sure, I know that, you know, but uh, he said, unless you're taking journalism classes, college can't help you learn to write. And he said, but you should take journalism classes. He said, because right. it, it teaches you a certain discipline. And so I did. And um, and he was right, of course. Um, his little exercise that he gave me was he said, every day when you get up, read a poem, read a short story, and read an essay. And he said, then you're good okay. for the day. And he said, whatever you want. Did, you know, he said, it doesn't matter what it is, just whatever you want. And then uh, after a while, he told me that uh, I should try to write a, uh, a short story every week. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, don't even worry about the quality at first. Just get it done. Right. And at the and he said, and then at the end of a year, you'll have 52 short stories. And and he said, and it's impossible for all of them to be rotten. <laughs> all right. We're going to do an odds thing, right? <laughs> you know, the roll of the dice. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
And so, yeah, um, what I hate to say, but it, it, you think about it, it's like, like, and everything in life practice makes perfect. The more you do sure. something, the better you get at it kind of thing. Yeah. He, he told me up, up front, you know, right, right away, he said, you know, this is going to be tough. You know, this is going to be tough doing this. He says, you're going to uh, miss out on a lot of things. You're going to get resentful of certain things, you know, probably if you want to follow this muse, you know, he mm -hmm. said, but uh, you know, it does have its own rewards and it certainly does. Uh, he said, but don't expect to get rich which is something I always tell everybody who ever approaches me wanting to be a writer. I said, don't expect to be Stephen King. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. But there is Stephen King. So that can happen. Right. But don't expect it. You know, just, just try right. to be a good writer. And, um, yeah. and he suggested that um, at the time he said, he said, what's going to happen is you're going to do this for probably four or five years of writing a story every week. And suddenly one day something's going to trip in your brain and you're going to get it. You're going to understand. And okay. that's exactly what happened. It sounded very mystic to me when he first described it. But that's right. exactly yeah, you know, what like, happened. Yeah, the, 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 that moment of enlightenment, you know, the yeah. clouds part and the sun comes through. And you, I get it. Yeah. Okay. In, in fact, he, he almost gave me kind of a riddle um, early on that's really difficult to explain the meaning of. You kind of have to experience it. But he said, uh, he said, I'll tell you what the whole secret to writing fiction is. He said, it's real simple. He said, start at the end as close as you can. In other words. At the end of the story? Yeah. Yeah. He said, start as close to the end of the story as you can think of. And then tell the Ooh, story. Wow. And I, I, that made no sense at all to me at the time. Right. You know? I was like, what are you talking about? And after about five years, I got it. I understood it. And it's still verbally very hard to explain what he was trying to say. But if you do it, it's suddenly it's clear to you and it's almost and just, an instinctive kind of thing. And you then know? you fill in the, the, I guess the, the in between. Yeah. You but just yeah. sort of realize, Hey, I think I know how to write, you know, and yeah. um, you know what it, I imagine it's true. Like there's really, yeah. And it's true because sometimes I think I mean, everybody's seen movies or stories or whatever that the end's kind of disappointing in a way, <laughs> you know, yeah, like he, you want the ending to be like, wow, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Now, now Ray, um, he didn't write, he didn't quite write the way he was telling me though. He had his own way, but he, he was trying to instruct me in a way that he felt would, would, uh, would best train me for it. But mm -hmm. what he did, like when I, when I'm writing a story, not every time, but in general, I do think of the ending first and then work toward it. Uh, but he didn't do that really generally what he, what he would do. And this was crazy. He'd wake up in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, right away, go to his typewriter. He never used a computer. In no, fact, he used, was, make, uh, let me <laughs> he used to make fun of me for using a computer. You know, it's not going to teach you anything. You know, I'm like, and I would right. argue with him a little bit saying, look, I think it does make me a better writer, Ray, because, you know, I can change things around easier and, yeah. and edit things. And I don't have to retype a whole damn page. You know, exactly. and, and you just be like, ah, the computers, you know, whatever. But yeah, well, but uh, he um, he would just get up in the morning and he would write a sentence or two. And then he'd get up and have breakfast and do his other things and then come back and then go back at it with no idea at all in his head of what he was going to do. Mm -hmm. And then by noon, he had a story. That's incredible. You know, so, he had at one time, wasn't, didn't they have, um, was it in the sixties or the seventies? Can't remember which network had like a weekly show based on his stories. I think that he was writing yeah, his stories. Yeah. That, that was in the eighties. Um, and he also so much. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was Ray Bradbury theater. Yeah. Ray Bad. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's still around. You can find it streaming in certain places. You know, it's still around. And the reason why um, I bring that up is I'm thinking, talk about you having to come up with ideas on a weekly mm -hmm. basis as far as storylines. Yeah. Well, well wow. all of those were based on his own stories that had already been published, but he mm -hmm. did write the screenplays for every single one of them. Incredible. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I it, he, he told me one time that some of the hardest writing he ever did was adapting his own work. You know, because he I said, bet. you're wanting to change it. You're getting to a point. He said, I, you know, I was, I was writing screenplays for things that I'd written 30 years ago. And I'd get to a point and I'd say, oh, I could do better than this. But no, that's what they wanted. You know, they wanted that story. They didn't want right. it to be altered. And so he said that was that was tough. That was tough to do that. <laughs> or I can imagine also if your story is like a, if they tell you, OK, well, it's got to fit into the X amount of film time, you know, like mm -hmm. production. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, okay, so what do I, how do I move this around so it's coherent versus yeah. what I originally wrote? Yeah, that's that's a good point. That's a real tough thing to do because generally uh, when you're writing a screenplay, it usually uh, runs about 
like a minute of of script it runs about a minute on screen okay. or, or, or one one page rather so it's a it's a minute a page so okay. his his show was about an hour long so figure in mm -hmm. commercials probably something like 53 minutes so right. each script would have to be 53 minutes long it, it couldn't be less and it couldn't be more so that's that's real tough to do to tell the, the story the story yeah that's so that's interesting because we don't we don't think of those things. I live about five miles from the homestead of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings, who wrote wow. the uh, yearling, you know, the. Sure. And sure. I was reading about, you know, I went there and, they, they, you know, they've still restored and they've kept her her house where she has to, uh, just have a porch. And she would say she would have to make herself sit there, you know, that discipline four hours at the very least. It shows where she had like a porch. She even put like a little bed so she could take like, I guess, like a nap next to her on her screen porch. And you could tell she had her, and they, because they reproduced everything, her ashtray, because she was a smoker. She, I was reading, she would, at the very least, would sit there four hours, if not more, but it had to be at least four hours to produce, you know. Right. In other words, that, that she had the discipline. How's that? Yeah, it, it does take discipline. It's, it's, it, you know, it's different for everybody. Sure. You know, whoever, you know, whoever is doing it. Uh, I don't know. I think I would probably go a little nuts if I actually had to sit in one place for four hours. So, <laughs> so I, I'll get up and feed the dogs and walk out around yeah. in the backyard and things like that. Because that, for one thing, I think it keeps me fresh. And if I get to a point where I'm stuck at anything, mm -hmm. it's usually best to move away from it for a little while, even right. if it's just five minutes. And come now they back. say I, that usually every 50 or 55 minutes, your brain hits saturation point, mm -hmm. which is exactly what you're like, that you kind of like, eh, especially if you're trying to figure stuff out. So yeah, yeah. I, absolutely, I agree with you. Yeah, you have to um, you have to figure that. Um, I, I, I mean, I've, I've always hit one of the one of my pet gripes on Facebook mm -hmm. is seeing lots of lots of writers' posts. I won't name anyone, but how they're constantly complaining about how hard it is and grueling, and there's just agonized. I'm like, guys, please do something else. Because no, this know. should not be torture, you know. It yes, should. it's hard work. It should be. Otherwise, everybody be doing it. Right. But, uh, but, you know, it's it should be. There should be joy mixed in there too. You know. Right. No. If you're no. Not enthusiastic as a writer, I'm not going to be enthusiastic as. A Let reader. me tell you something, and and I agree with this description. They said, that, and this applies as far as if you want to know if something is your passion. If you would do it, and you would, and and it was like you're never going to get recognition for this. Like what you said, you're never going to become a Stephen King. You might need, would you still do it? I think real writers say, I will still do it. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it, like, oh, okay. So nobody ever knows who I am. I I would do it if I, if I got paid for it or not, honestly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't that, think I could right. stop at this point. So, right. and I think some people you put either the recognition or the money thing and you right. say, you're not going to get either. They'd be like, I'm out of here. Bye. Right. Yeah. I've been lucky enough to to have done it full time for, you know, a few decades, but um, uh, going on three, actually. And, but that's it's been pure luck. And, and that's another thing, too, that when when I see the egos that sometimes arise in this business, I'm like, you know, guys, everything is luck, everything, yeah. mm -hmm. because I've, I've known writers who had a really tough time of it and, and um, you know, were heartbroken by the industry and. Um, and uh, and worse that were brilliant i mean they were brilliant yes uh, and yet you know they just it just wasn't there for them you know and they just weren't in that right place you mm -hmm. know right place, and right uh, and that's one of the things that ray was trying to tell me too is he said if you if you keep at it and you're doing it all the time and you're always sending something out that eventually the lightning will strike if you keep at it long enough he said you know it might take 40 years it might take five you know five days you just right. never know. It's it's just, but you got to be there, you know, when the door opens. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. You if you there. if you don't sub, I imagine if you don't submit something, then forget it. You're you know, that. How did you get involved with like the the genre of the monsters and all that other stuff? Did was it just by coincidence or what? I don't think um, so. But loved it as a kid. I guess I, uh, um, I, <laughs> I remember uh, the first thing I that 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 I remember as far as movies go, there was the original King Kong, uh, yes. the 1933 King Kong. Mm -hmm. And I was, out, I remember I was, I was, I was probably four or five years old. I was out playing in the backyard in the sandbox thing, you know, and my mom came out and she said, uh, 
come in here. There's something on TV I, 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 you know, you'll, you'll like to see. And she had a very pronounced uh, Tennessee accent. And she said, it's okay. about a giant. This is the way she put it. She said, it's about a giant griller. Okay. And you're like, oh. said, so she knew her kid, oh. right? <laughs> right. And so I thought, well, I know what gorillas are. A giant, really? Seriously. And so I came in and, and watched it. And I was just spellbound. You know, my jaw hit the floor. And I was just like, oh. Uh -huh. And, of course, that, that was my introduction to dinosaurs, too. Yes. Uh, which I thought, like the giant ape, was just something made up in the movies. I didn't realize that dinosaurs had been real, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I found that out a year or so later when my brother took me to the library. Right. Blew right. my mind. Yeah. You know, That's what they have mind. on all the children's section is a bunch of books on dinosaurs. Yeah. Blew my mind. Yeah. So, um, and then I think uh, the next one I remember was Brighter Frankenstein, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, it just kind of, I don't know. I, I It's something that I think the, the modern horror movies lack. Um, I know they have their fans and that's great. That's fine. But they, they lack in terms of we're not sympathetic to the monsters anymore. You know, right. now they're mostly just kind of hackers and killers and slashers. And that's and what I was going to say into the 60s and early 70s. It shifted. Right. Um, you know, they there was became like hammer films, <laughs> you know, with, you know, Christopher right. Lina's bloodshot eyes, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but but it used it, to be, you know, like, who, you know, who didn't feel sorry for King Kong when he died? You know, oh my and, God, thank God. I'm not the only one. I was like, oh, <laughs> the, <laughs> Lucy, hush. <laughs> No, 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 no. The, okay. uh, the, uh, the irony of King Kong to me, even as a kid, and I got this, was that um, um, I, as, as the audience, we're the only ones who understand that King Kong is the hero. Yes. Nobody else in the movie seems to understand it. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, that's really bizarre. But uh, well, I, I, that's one of the things that, you know, they make it look like, well, also the audience back then, you know, they, I think everybody's mental mentality was different, mm -hmm. you know? And right. um, so I sympathize with the, with the, the monsters in those days, you know, like oh, yeah. Frankenstein monster, the wolf man, the mummy, all those, you know, because sure. I felt that they were kind of victims in a way, you know, mm -hmm. they didn't really want to be what they were, you know, they, sure. they couldn't help it that nobody, nobody liked them. <laughs> well, yeah. So, you know, I mean, if you look at it, Frankenstein was created wolf man, Again, he didn't go looking to become a wolf man. Um, well, the the original, uh, the Dracula is, you know, it wasn't the same thing. It was a kind of like a different, but it was a different type of monster, I want to say. Yeah. Yeah, Dracula um, was different. He enjoyed what he was. Right, right. He <laughs> is like, hey, you know. And, it, you know, later on is when they romanticized him a little bit more. And then there was this period where I tell everybody, you know, once upon a time, the vampire was ugly. You know, he might have mm -hmm. been them with the teeth and uh, and then all of a sudden he became buff and drove a Volvo, you know, yeah. or, <laughs> or, you know, and I, I get it. Um, but, you know, they wanted to put away even when he got, you know, was going to bite somebody. He still like was very nice looking. Um, they, they've romanticized it. Yes. I mean, if anybody, you know, uh, ever, you know, actually, I don't know if they still read dracula you know mm -hmm. anymore it's, it's always in bookstores so somebody's there there's so yeah. many different publishers that publish the book somebody must be reading these i would think sure. um but yeah he's not like that at all in the book he's very much a monster in the book i mean he's oh, yeah. uh, um he's kind of hideous looking he's got you know pointed ears and this long hooked nose and the teeth that stick out over his lips and he's got bad breath and yeah no <laughs> even know. even when he's not like a vampire he's ugly he's not there was nothing what can i say and uh bella lugosi uh, that was okay you know he was like kind of like a, okay um lugosi yeah, there was something kind of unearthly about him though you know yeah. he didn't seem like he didn't seem like he was of the world he just was there's right. something uh, especially in the scenes in, in his dracula movie where he um is is alone by himself and it's only the audience watching him when there's no other characters around him just to watch him he's he's completely different than when he's interacting with people when he's mm -hmm. putting on the charade you know um there's a there's just something about him and i think that's why he became so iconic yes uh, it's that he did not seem to be a human being really he was something different and i like christopher lee's interpretation very much too which is more like the book actually um, right. Think, yeah. The, the different uh, versions a much more, of a much more feral, um, you know, uh, 
version of, of, of the vampire. But, you know, uh, the vampire legends in Central Europe are hardly the romantic characters like oh, a Van no, Rice. No. I mean, they're basically like the walking dead i mean it's what they were they were reanimated yes, corpses yes, um, yes. yeah the, the, this is and back I, you know i tell everybody yeah, nowadays they still are discovering in romania and poland what they call these deviant burials of mm -hmm. people that they're finding back in the 17th 18th century that they were burying them in certain ways like to make sure they didn't rise from the dead in other words these people really believe or fear the dead coming back and they would either do it at the burial or if soon after the person died, any other family members passed away, of course, who was responsible? The dead person does it. They would put like a sickle across the neck or, you know, bury them face down. Or I've even heard that they would put this was, this is a lock on their big toe, <laughs> you know, anything <laughs> to keep them grounded. In other words, and this was not an isolated, they, they, they've come across, you know, now that they're, you know, archaeology and, um, They've come across a lot of what they call these burials. These they they really believe this, and like you said, it wasn't the uh, the guy in the uh, the maitre d outfit. You know, it was no. no. <laughs> it, was, it was like, um, yeah, they uh, they had a very big fear of the dead coming back. I I, I think that probably the most uh, um, mythologically accurate version of. Of, of a vampire is probably the original Nosferatu, the 1922. Yes. Um, yes. That that's something that really does not look like it ever could have been human. At, right. At one point, you know, and it's uh, uh it, it's not exactly the way vampires are described in folklore, but but there's but mm -hmm. the filmmaker he he understood it, he got it. You know, this is not a character that was that that could not blend in, you know, with the rest sure. of us at all. You know, he's right. right there. It wasn't like you know you can't. I want to say one of. I like it because obviously it was very well made and they, but they combined the, the nice, the suave with, which, which was Francis Ford Coppola's version mm -hmm. where, you know, of course he's the prince by day, but when right. he turns into the vampire, he get, he really goes vampire, you know, instead of like uh, that, that I like that version a lot in the sense of, but yeah, there was a time period where, um, and I want to say as vampires, one of the, uh, I don't, the, um, oh my God, was uh, Salem's Lot. That was mm. when they were still making, you know, vampires scary looking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I get I, I, yeah, I remember Stephen King uh, saying in an interview about Salem's Lot that uh, uh, when he was writing it, he was determined that he wasn't going to make the vampires sexy. There you he go. said, I wanted to make them just plain, just flat out terrifying, you know. Yes. Yes. And uh, it, it works for that. But, you know, it, it's, it's a, that's a subject that, um, that can be that can evolve in several different ways, and I and I mean I like the Anne Rice stuff too. Mm -hmm, and uh, yes. it, there's a I I think really what's kind of started the romantic vampire was really probably Dark Shadows with Barnabas Collins. I, I saw yeah. Dark Shadows. Oh, I love it too. It's big. Uh, <laughs> my wife and I went to um, a Sleepy Hollow over Halloween, and uh, uh -huh. you know, the Lynnhurst Mansion there was used in the two Dark Shadows movies. And okay. uh, we, we were there in the vault where they supposedly buried Carolyn Coll Collins, you know. Okay. Uh, Carolyn Stoddard Collins. Yes. Right. Uh, and, um, and we were in there and there's this, there's this empty vault, you know, there's, it's like, it's like a crypt and there's this one empty vault that had Barnabas's picture in it, in a frame. Really? <laughs> and I was like, where's Barnabas? And I pointed to it. Right. And, yeah. That's like, <laughs> and you know what, that it's really funny because people don't realize, and I didn't, that originally it it didn't really start out as a vampire. Like Barnabas wasn't there at the beginning. They kind of no. introduced him later, but it just yes. started out more like a Gothic kind of like yeah. that mystery kind yeah. of thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. It was more like Withering Heights or something. Withering uh, Heights, you know, the originally. governess goes off to the mysterious house mm -hmm. with a mysterious family and, you know, all this stuff. Barnabas didn't yeah. come into the picture till phew, well, later it was on. A little over a year, actually, yeah. I think uh -huh. the show was on uh -huh. before he came on it. But boy, it yeah. changed then, you know, and uh, became quite a sensation. I think it was on yes. the air for five years, I believe. And it was a big deal for me when I was a kid. You know, I, I was one of those that ran home from school. Yeah, I, I me and, too. Uh, and watched the show, you know. And, and my mom, who uh, watched a couple soap operas uh, pretty loyally before Dark Shadows came on, she yeah. started watching it with me. Yes. And so uh, that was kind of cool. And occasionally some char new character would come on the show and mom would say, oh, she used to be on one of my stories. You know? Yeah, they, they'd switch and so that was kind of fun. Poppers. 
But uh, but yeah, I love Dark Shadow. Was on before the, but it was like um, and late and I've, because you know some of the stuff they even went later on into Wolfman territory. They went everywhere. Mm -hmm. they, oh, they went did, like. Yeah. Yeah, there was influence from like Turn of the Screw, um, Dr. Yes. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. It was just like all kinds of stuff in there. That, yeah, they, 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 they didn't Lovecraft stop the vampire. Movie. And you yeah. know that they later on they had a, a beauty contest from his Ghost America. Oh, yeah, I remember where, something about that. <laughs> yes, they had it. They had two. They had Miss Ghost America and I think Miss Vampire America, something like that. And uh, Barnabas Collins, which, my God, what's his real name? I can't remember Jonathan, now. J Jonathan Jonathan Frid. Frid. He was, of course, the one that presented it. And it was the first prize was you would get to go to New York or some somewhere where they were going to film it. And they were going to somehow insert you into the episode. You know who won that first time round? You remember the girl, Sashin Littlefeather, who took the prize for Marlon Brando or accepted the prize for Marlon Brando? Oh she goodness. was the winner. And she didn't turn up. She was like, well, she won. Because you were supposed to dress up like a vampirist kind of deal. She won the contest and she just decided, I'm not going to go. And she never went. And then they, they chose the runner up who went to New York and whatever. And I don't know how they did the, the, the thing, you know, to put wow. her in the show, but yeah, weird stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, but, uh, I didn't, I'd never heard that before. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yes. So Sheen little feather was the first winner of Miss uh, ghost America. <laughs> yeah. And that was, it was all publicity of course, you know, because it was like, what they did was they had like semifinalists from each state and then they had a final thing and that's that's how they chose it. And uh, did you ever get to see the the remake that they did in the 90s with Ben Cross? Oh, yes. I loved it. Yes. Yeah. That was well done. He made a good yeah. vampire, too, by the way. He did. And um, I, I remember that, uh, you know, Dan Curtis, who, you know, created Dark Shadows and produced yes. these, that um, he... He had just done, I think, War and Remembrance, I believe, on TV, mm -hmm. and it won all kinds of awards and everything. Right. And so they were after him to do something else, and the the network said, you know, we would really like you to revive Dark Shadows. And he's like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do Dark Shadows again. And um, and he was just saying that because he did want to do it, but he said the only way he would do it is he wanted to do it in such a way that he that he could have done it originally. Like if he had had all the money that he could get right. now, you know, this, that's what he wanted to do. So, uh, so eventually they, they gave him what he wanted and uh, you know, he, um, he recast the, the show. Uh -huh. And, uh, and I think they, it, it's only like something like 13 episodes because the Gulf War yeah, was but they, going they, on. They canceled it and they said they had people picketing it. and upset because they canceled yeah. it. And I was and, one of them. Yeah, I, I, was, was great. I, was, I was like, what? You know, you can't be, well, you yeah, know, the other day I was watching and I was going, this has to be a dancer. And I, I probably said a long time ago, it was the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde back produced with Jack Palance. Mm -hmm. And they were reusing the music from Dark Shadows. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm sitting there watching. I go, wait a minute. I know this music. Yeah. If that was directed by Jack, by Dan Curtis too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. 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 Evan, yeah. I think it won like six semis or it did, it did really well. It did. And, Jack Palance is, is amazing in that. Oh, no, he's fantastic. He's, he's just great. amazing. I love Jack Palance. That he was the be... first, uh, when I was a kid, that was the first um, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde movie I ever saw. Mm -hmm. So it made a huge impression on me, you know, and uh, um, yes. and it, the makeup and everything. I, I love just like the subtle makeup that he has. In that. Right. It's, it wasn't. And this is, and I tell everybody for who's been alive for a little bit longer than yesterday, there was once a time where there was no computer graphics or FX as far as. <laughs> you know, for movies or anything where basically the actors, you, you know, yeah, of course you got some makeup, but you better be good at spatial, you know, as far as your, what you're coming across with, because you don't have a computer or anything to fix it or to make you scarier. And like what you said about Jack Palance holds true, especially in yeah, that. He, uh, I mean, he was, uh, it was an inspired ca cast, uh, casting of him because he, um, he was mainly known as a, as a Western villain, really, yes. at that particular yeah. time, and mm -hmm. uh, and just a West, just a a movie villain in general, really. And yeah. uh, uh, who could have ever thought that he could have played such a gentle and sympathetic Doctor Jekyll? Because he really yeah. is a co totally different guy. Yeah, when he's yeah. playing Jekyll, and I love the fact that they that they went along more with the book and had Jekyll yes. uh, older. You know, he's mm -hmm. you know, Jekyll's supposed to be 
uh, in his 50s, I think. And Hyde is the young one because he's just right. born. You know, yes. so, uh, so I thought that was uh, that was a nice touch. I like the other like the, the Frederick March version, too, um, mm -hmm. with the more kind of Neanderthal looking Hyde. I like that as well. But uh, but I think the one that um, that Jack Palance did is probably more like what Robert Louis Stevenson had in mind when he wrote the right. story, I believe. Right. That it's like the the yeah, well, this is what he wanted, the where basically one one personality wants to win out over the other one. Like you, sure. you, you, you can't have can it both ways. Can you imagine what it must have been like when that book first came out and nobody knew that Jekyll was Hyde? Now everybody knows it before you right. watch it or read it. But there was a time when that was considered a mystery story, and that was a big surprise. It was like, oh my God, you yes, know. and it was like, so, and I know that no, he's. Uh, it was one of those things where, of course, now we look at it, but you know, God, no, nobody understands. You know, as far as uh, science or what science can do. I mean, if you want to look at it, he has a flavor of very early sci-fi in a way. Oh sure, yeah, absolutely, you know. it does. The same as Frankenstein, it does as well. You know. It, um, although uh, for me, um, I mean, you hear a lot of science, science fiction, uh, writers, you know, praising Frankenstein as being sort of the forerunner of like technology out of control, you know, kind uh -huh. of thing. But for me, what, what, how it affected me, and it's, it's my favorite book, right. Um, is, um, that it's really a story of an unwanted child is really what it is at its heart. Yeah. If you look at it. Yes. And, and I think that's what make that's, what's made it stay around. You know, that we uh, we sympathize with the creature in the story because it's us, you know, right. who hasn't at one time or another felt that they didn't fit in and sure. they weren't you know, part of all this and, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. And it's um, especially right. and, when and, and Frankenstein, I mean, well, as far as the doctor, it's his hubris. He wants to become God mm -hmm. and, you know, he takes all these parts and he creates a creature that doesn't want him, you know, after right. it's like. So it's yeah, like it, looked, it looked okay dead on the table, but when it comes to life, it was pretty scary. Like, oh. <laughs> no, well, you know, and of course, everybody's seen that young Frankenstein version with the Abbey oh, yeah. Normal. That's brain. awesome. <laughs> but yeah, it's like one of those things. Like, you know, you're irresponsible because what are you going to do once once it actually works? Like, did you ever plan that far? That's what happens <laughs> later on, where you know that's always been the version of. Um, you know, the Frankenstein monster is, and of course he's supposedly indestructible in a, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, so when did you, because I, I see, like I tell, well, now they're behind you, but those two Frankenstein heads. Uh, <laughs> what did you, did you look at these? Was it the, did you become inspired to say, I'm going to do a spinoff. I'm going to take these characters and I'm going to do my version. If I would have written it or use them or how, how did you, how did you uh, work? Because it's, they're, those characters are, I mean, the stories are already written, but to me, I look at it and I go, man, you could do a lot with, you know, besides the Bride of Frankenstein thing. You sure. Um, well, anytime I've, I've um, done my own take on any of the classic characters, and I've written nine Sherlock Holmes books. Oh my God. So, that's, that's... Um, and there's hardly probably any person in the civilized world that doesn't know who Sherlock Holmes is, you know, and everybody, even if he, they, you haven't read the books at all, mm -hmm. you still kind of know what he's supposed to kind of look like and how he's supposed to act. Yes. Yeah, and, there's uh, so many I, versions of them. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I've, I've always tried to uh, res always tried to respect the author, the original author and, I... uh, and present their vision. Now, of course, it's going to be some of me in there too. I can't help that, <laughs> but sure. um but uh, yeah, I think it's a um, it's a testament to like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Mary Shelley, Bram Stoker, and character, uh, other writers like that. That there's so much more to their characters than they than they were able to do at the time in their yes. lifetime. Yes. That mm -hmm. they uh, they keep going on. I mean, Conan Doyle felt that after only writing Sherlock Holmes for a year or two, that he had done all he could do, and he really sort of protested that he did the rest. You know, let me tell you, he has some great stories. I love. Arthur Conan Doyle. He has a lot of great stories. Oh, there he's a, he was an amazing writer. He yeah. He, he for some reason did not feel that Sherlock Holmes was anything special. You know, he you it's what made him famous. It's what made him right. rich. 
but he mm-hmm. uh, he never got it. He never understood why this why this guy. You know, I'm writing these other books I'm more proud of. You know, kind yes. of thing. And yeah. um, people would just go, no, no, we want we want Holmes. I got to speak to his uh, his daughter back in uh, around 1990 or so because when my okay. first Sherlock Holmes book came out, Scarlet and Gaslight, uh, mm-hmm. it was igno- it was licensed by the estate, okay. and so I was able to talk to her um, for I don't know about 40 minutes or so, and she was she was a delightful lady. But um, she uh, and and I asked her point blank. I said, you know, you always read that that your dad hated Sherlock Holmes. You know, I said, what what was your take on that? And she said, she said, you know, I think he doth protest too much. Is what she said. Right. And she said, uh-huh. uh, she said Sherlock Holmes wasn't just a character that my dad created, that my father created. She said he lived in our house. You know, he said Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, she said, I, you know, when I would see see my dad wearing his. Uh, purple dressing gown and smoking his pipe there by the fire. That was Sherlock Holmes. You know, yeah. said, you know Sherlock, uh-huh. my dad was Sherlock Holmes, you know? Yeah, exactly. Said, right. But then, then she would uh, turn it around and she'd say, uh, she said, oh, it was wonderful being, you know, the daughter of, of such a famous writer, because she said, sometimes we would get celebrities come and visit us. And mm-hmm. she said, you know, she said, my father became, you know, quite good friends with Harry Houdini, who used to visit us on the, on the weekends sometimes. Right. And he would uh, let me sit in his lap and he would pull American quarters out of my ears from nowhere. <laughs> and you know what? And I understand that they had a falling out because of yeah, they did. the, you know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, his belief in spiritualism and Houdini's like, Psh. I really truly think at the end of the day, I think Houdini was hoping somebody was going to prove him wrong is the way I feel about it. Uh, yeah. According to, um, I've, I've met a few people uh, over the years that actually that knew Houdini as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, and apparently his feeling was that um, he wasn't really saying it wasn't real. He was just saying that what what was going on with these mediums and so forth, they were charging people so much money and things oh, yeah. like that, that that wasn't real because he was catching them f- fake while they were faking because he was a magician. He knew how to do it. Right. But he wasn't saying that there was no life after death. He was hoping that that was the case. Um, and he always said up to pretty much up to his death that he he believed that there were genuine psychics uh, and mediums as well. He just hadn't met any yet. Right. You know, and is so, that back then for some reason was the time where these mediums would produce these ectoplasm stuff? Right. Like, what, that? what is that? You know, I mean, yeah. I know what ectoplasm is, but, you know, where they would have to come with this stuff out of and it'd be like, all right, whatever. Huh. But, yeah, yeah, I know that. uh I mean, that still goes on. It's it still goes on today to a degree. It's just kind of underground now. Sure. You know, sure. and you um, know, all they all they need is, um, you know, if you uh, if you look at any, and, and, and to me, honestly, after a while, it becomes a downer when you see some of these shows with um, psychics. What was it, John Edwards? I think was one of them that he doesn't have any. After a while, obviously, you could tell most of the people obviously is dead, but people that have lost children, you know, which. Come on, let's face it. And after a while, I stopped watching it because, like, this is depressing, <laughs> you know. And I think that's what maybe Houdini was thinking. Like, you know, you're getting these people who are so desperate just to get anything, you know. Uh, especially this was post World War One, things of that nature, where, for lack of a better word, they're more gullible. Right. Yeah. And and plus, they wanted it so bad, you know. And it's yeah. natural to to, to, yeah. to believe that. And um, but yeah, I remember, um, oh, years, some years ago, it was on some talk show. I don't know which one it was, but, um, Sylvia Brown was wow. a guest on a talk show and she was ta- telling this one couple, they were asking where their, their daughter had disappeared and so forth. And right. she said, oh, she's, she said, she's dead. I'm sorry. She was murdered. And it turned out a couple years later, her daughter showed up that Ooh. she had just run away. And from then, and I, I never had a whole lot of respect for Sylvia no, Brown I to begin wasn't. with. Uh-huh. But um, but after that, I kind of thought, you know, what an awful person you are, you know. Well, there was one part that this was. Remember when she would come up regularly to Montel Williams' show, the talk show he had, and there was I can't remember for the life of me what, but there was some country where a bunch of miners had uh, they, they they had thought they had lost the miners. I don't want to say even it was in the U.S. I want to say it was in South or Central America somewhere. I can't remember. Bottom line, something along the same lines. They're asking her, and she, and it was one of those things that time had gone by, and they knew that they had X amount of time before they could get him out that they were going to be alive. She kind of said something along the same lines, as in, I think that they're gone. This is, you know, like maybe an hour later, 
newsflash, they were able to get him out. It was like a 11th hour kind of rescue. Right. She lost a lot of credibility with that. And it was like, well, no, I just, I meant that, <laughs> you know, they almost, died. uh, that kind of deal. So, yeah. When Mike, it comes to Mike, something like that, you have to be very careful with people's feelings. Yeah. I mean, my experience in this has been that, um, I mean, I've met some people that I feel um, were, were, were genuine psychics. Mm -hmm. um, they, um, they're, they're people that nobody knows. They're not famous. Yes. Uh, they don't charge for their, you know, for their, right. shall we call them their services. A couple of them that I knew worked with the police mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. And they don't want to be known. It's actually yes. a, a rather unrewarding thing to be a psychic. It's not yes. like they even enjoy it. Most of them don't. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you can turn on and off. So sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes yes. they get nothing. You know, so it's not, it's it's rather unrewarding and sometimes even painful. Um, I, that's I, what it I, really I, is. It's not glamorous. <laughs> no, it's like, I know it's not like what they look. I think that, let's say, during that time that Houdini was busting, I tell everybody, I think that psychic powers comes like you said, comes and goes. Some days you're good and some days, but when, let's say back then, if you were have one of these parlors and basically you're paying the rent, the roof over your head with your psychic powers, you better be psychic every day. So I think that a lot of the days that they weren't psychic, the real ones though, they had mm -hmm. to produce something. So that's when they had all the trick stuff because I, I don't think that's, that psychic stuff is a steady stream all the time. Right, right. But hey, if that person's paying you, and I got to pay my bills. Guess what? Yeah, you, I better come yeah, up with something. Do, yeah, you got to do something. I, yeah. I I think that's been the case in a lot of the more famous uh, poltergeist cases too. Uh, mm -hmm. The the ones even that are authentic, that yes. occasionally the people there will fake it because the media and everybody's there and they're wanting something to happen. Oh and no! So, Once it gets the media attention, it yeah. was like whoa! Like the Enfield, the one in England, the mm -hmm. UK. Yeah, um, I mean that's a very well documented case that I think was yes. real. But yes. yeah, there was some stuff in it that was a little shady too, you know. Yeah, there was that's, um, that's the phenomenon. Not too long ago, <laughs> one of the photographers who because of, there was like three sisters, you know, and there was one that was like the target child. And she's the one that's photographed like supposedly flying through the air from one bed to the other. Mm -hmm. And he came out and he said, She, you know, because there was a dispute where she had jumped, if you know, she had jumped from one bed to the other. Right. Said, she didn't jump, she like levitate, you know, in other words. This wasn't a kid that's jumping from one bed to the other because he caught her like in midair, the photograph. And he said, no, she was. And who was it that I spoke to that? Obviously, she's a full grown woman. She's still kind of like a nervous Nelly kind of thing. And like all poltergeist stuff, you know, eventually there comes an end to it, especially, you know, the, you know, the stressors, adolescence, blah, 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 things of this nature. Yeah. But yeah, I can uh, end yeah. Quite suddenly. yes, yeah, it's I... as suddenly as it starts. And yeah, they have, you know, the same features. Well, I mean, some of it is um, just is is beyond explanation because, I mean, uh, especially like uh, airports and by location, things like that, where, mm -hmm. where things seemingly fall out of the ceiling. Yes. You know, how do you do uh, that? Yeah. I mean, uh, I've actually experienced that myself. Oh, you got to uh, tell me what happened with that. And so, well, when it's uh, it was actually here in this house mm -hmm. and um we had just, uh, we've been here about close to nine years, but it was, this was within the first year or two. And there okay. were weird things going on in the house around that time. Okay. Uh, nothing okay. malevolent, you know, nothing that was really s scary, so to speak, right. startling, you know. Okay. Um, but, uh, but we would hear, um, sometimes it sounded like somebody talking in another room and it's just me and my wife and the two dogs, you know. Yeah. And, uh, All right. <laughs> things like that. And um, we would, uh, uh, sometimes a door would open on its own. The cabinets in the in the kitchen were constantly opening and closing. You know, I'd, I'd go in, I'd walk into the kitchen. Cabinets would all be open. Okay, you're like, I know I didn't do that exactly. You know, but I, you know, but cabinets will open on their own sometimes. But then you go back in a little while later and they're closed. I don't know that that happens. You know, naturally. Yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, I was walking uh, down the stairs down here to my my studios here in the basement. And um, something hit me on the head. And I was by myself. Uh, nobody else in the house but me and the, and the dogs. And it hit me on the head and it fell on the steps. And I looked down and it was a penny. 
and uh, I was like, what? I looked uh -huh. at it. It was like this 1916 penny. Okay. I still have it. And, okay. uh, and then, oh, a year or two later, on, uh, doing the same thing, going down the same stairs, another thing hit me on the head. And this was a woman's earring. And it's just wow. like a post, a post earring, uh -huh. um, uh, like fake diamond post earring, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, the, which my wife does not wear those kind of earrings. Right. But, so, but well, I mean, where it fell on my head. <laughs> right. That's what I'm saying. It came from like, you know, that's and incredible. It's, it's not something that I told a lot of people about at the time because they're like, you know, well, yeah, right. You're the crazy writer guy. But um but I've gotten to the point now where I don't care anymore. <laughs> you know, just kind of like. So oh. that, as the time has gone by, has it gotten just every once, you know, sporadic it's, or. It's been real calm for quite a while. Um, okay. There's not been anything for quite a while. Uh, I'm going to ask you. We've had people. Obvious... We've had guests, you know, house guests that have that have seen and heard things, too, in the past. Nothing okay. real recent, though. But I mean, I've had odd things like that happen to me my whole life. So it's it's not oh, see, you know, we gotta talk a great about surprise. That. Because I, I've been a paranormal investigator before people thought of us paranormal investigators, just the 90s. And I mean, I've heard, you know, a lot of stories of different things. But um, so basically, you, you, you know, even it was not only the house where you've been before. I don't know what yeah. it is. I'm going to tell you real quick, as far as kitchens, that sometimes this is this is my first idea that whoever's there, it was their house. I remember when I was like 16, we rented a house across the street from my grandmother. And I, my audience, I, I'm going to repeat the story. I know you've heard it a million times. That was My mom would tell me, she'd leave first for work. She'd tell me, if you're ever going to stay home, you feel sick, you need to call your grandmother, let her know you're home, blah, blah. Even though we lived right across the street. One morning I get up and what wakes me up is the, the kitchen of the house was towards the front. And I was in the back bedroom all the way at the end of the hallway. And I hear, you know, when people are opening their drawers and like searching for stuff. And then I hear like, and this was an older house, like built like in the forties. And even though I've been modern, it was still the, 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 it was the wooden cabinets. And, and I'm hearing the first thing that comes to my head is my grandmother came over. She had a key, but the truth was she had really bad arthritis. It, there was nothing that we had, but it's really funny because you hear like the kitchen drawers opening at the same time. And then like the utensils being somebody, and then somebody look going through. And I thought it was my grandmother. And I said, crap, you know? I'm thinking, oh, she came over here. So all of a sudden, it was the raised flooring, wooden flooring. And I hear somebody coming, even though it had carpeting, I hear the tread on the hallway coming towards the bedroom I'm in. So I turned over, like, with my back towards the door. This, my grandmother would have said, why didn't you go to school? Oh, and the truth was nothing was wrong. I just wanted to stay home. Eh. One of those things. I hear the tread coming down the hallway. Whoever it is stops in the door with a room. And of course, I'm like this. And I don't know how to explain it because people don't, I'm not seeing anything, but my grandma was a short lady. And for some reason, mm -hmm. the feeling I got was that whoever was watching me that stopped in the doorway was taller. But I didn't get scared, honestly. And I said, I'm going to pretend, you know, this is what you do when you're 15 or 16. Years. I'm going to pretend I'm going to sleep so my grandmother won't give me the, you know, the fifth degree. On that. You know, somebody came up took the blanket from around my waist and pulled it over my shoulder. Okay. I didn't think twice about it. Okay. The tread for oh, my grandma, whatever. <clears throat> my mom gets home. One of the first things she would do is she would cross the street to go see my grandmother. Five minutes later, I get a phone call. My mom, why didn't you tell your grandma that you stayed home from school? I'm like, I go, she knows I was here. She came into the house this morning. Here, my grandmother in the background going, what? She's a liar. I never went over there. And part of me is like, <laughs> you know, part of me is like, I know that, you know, what you know, when you're like, because I knew she wouldn't have, she just went, she had, she had a key, but she would never, I, I could never remember her coming over. There was nothing we had, you know, cooking, nothing. And I'm like, she's like, she's a lie. She's what you my mom, of course, nobody's believing me that how could I imagine this? But at that time, you don't really ponder those things when you're like 16. A couple of other things happen, like what you're talking about. That later on, I look back at it now. I was like, wait a minute. There was a haunting going on there. It wasn't, like you said, not malevolent or, you know, or anything like what you see in the, you know, these movies. But when you look at it, you know, you know, from years and when you put them together, you know, a couple of times 
we had those jealousy windows. This is South Florida. There was, and I would, I would stay up late, you know, and I would hear what a couple of times I heard somebody walking on the grass, like coming up to the window. Now I had grown up in this neighborhood. So everybody, and so much so, I remember I would jump into my mom's bed. She was asleep, poor thing. There's somebody, there's somebody in the yard. There's somebody in the yard. She's like, what? She would turn and we're running, you know, we're going from window to window. There's nothing. You never heard anybody running off on the grass. Plus it didn't have any trees, nothing. No shaking, somebody jumping a fence. That happened twice. One time I remember I was, you know, since I said it was the raised roof, the I was like at my desk and the window's right here in the backyard. And I hear footsteps that's coming straight to that window. Like I thought if I look up, I'm going to see. Somebody looking at me, which, by the way, talk about the perfect horror movie moment. <laughs> and I flipped my chair back. Mom, there's nobody in the yard. She's like, never. And then I look back and I think, I think it was the old owner of the house that his wife was the one that was renting the house out to us because it was never really like bad or a bad mm -hmm. feeling. But you kind of wig out because I didn't think it was a dead person. I was thinking it was a live person. Uh, live persons are more scary. Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. Of course. But I think uh, things, things like that is like, uh, but like, y you know, contrary to what people think, so a lot of sometimes these hauntings, they start, they're, they're not, they don't start out like your furniture's flying across the room. It starts no. like what you just described. You know, you get a report, um, right. weird stuff happens. Uh, did you ever know who the, the prior owner was of the house or? Um, yes, we, um, um, we, our neighbors on either side of us have been here a long time and they knew her. Okay. She was an older lady. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, she did pass away in the house. Right. Um, so, uh, I don't, at least I think she did. If I'm remembering right. It's been right. a while. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know how I feel about a lot of this stuff because I, I know that, um, I know that it's real. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's not a question of belief. You know, I know I've experienced it. It's been right there, right. you know. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, I, I don't know about the whole um, life after death spirit thing. You know, I don't know. Uh, it It's, it's kind of like UFOs, which I had experience with that when I was a kid. Okay. I tell you about. But uh, it, it ghosts, I, ghosts are undoubtedly real. And I think that they're probably at least as real as dreams, but I'm mm -hmm. not convinced that they're the spirits of the dead. I, nothing has right. proved that to me yet. There's something, something's going on. Right. And some people you know, will right. tell you, oh, no, it's just an imprint, you know, on the fabric of wherever you're at. Like, in other words, you're, there's no intelligence, no soul. Yeah. How's that? Maybe not. But, then, but some cases seem to prove otherwise, though. Sure. Of um, course. But there's also things like, you know, there's there's places that that see like ghostly horse and carriages or even, mm -hmm. even a ghostly um, locomotive. Yes. And you know, those don't have, you know, do, do they have souls locomotives? I don't think so. Right. So. And it makes you think But some things are repetitive. I, I interviewed one time, one gentleman, he moved into what they call millionaires row over in um, St. Louis. You know, this mm -hmm. was where the big mansions, anybody, one of these, you know, some of these, these houses become decrepit after a while. So he right. got it for a really good price and he renovated it. But he says every morning, he says, no matter where you were, you would smell coffee coming from the kitchen downstairs, you know, real strong coffee. And he goes without fail. And he goes, I was the only one in the house and I wasn't making any coffee. So part of that, I think is that fabric of it imprints, something that was repetitive, you know, as far as the, something that happened a lot, you know, we're with, yeah. with, uh, I don't know, sort of a you know, sort of a psychic videotape almost. Yeah. Um, yeah. The physics are proving that a lot of what we perceive as reality is not really what we perceive. There's yeah. more to it, kind of deal. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, also, you know, I mean, it's it's probably whatever all whatever this stuff is. It's probably a whole bunch of different things. You know, sure. it's probably not just one thing. You know, it, there's probably yeah. all kinds of things that uh, uh, that imitate the phenomenon. Uh, like like the the phantom cats that you hear about the big like mm -hmm. the black panthers and things some yes. of them seem to be real animals and others you know look real enough but suddenly they're they like vanish before your eyes or whatever right it doesn't exactly. mean that all of them are spooky 
ghost cats, but maybe some right. of them. You know, so right. uh, I mean, I, Washington D.C. has a, a ghost cat out there. I mean, that's been a while for a while, and out here in Florida, you'll get a lot of people that'll say we've seen well, the equivalent does a black panther. Mm -hmm. You know, we have them here too. We have them here too. You know that people will um, say well, they've sighted them. Hunters will say, "Hey, I saw this." And um, part of it is like, well, okay, how many people can be mistaken? Yeah, the 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 game the the the, the game wardens and so forth that will tell you that, that that that's not true. But I of course, a lot they of them are told. You know, they, they're told you better not ever say. Of course, they will. My my wife, in fact, um, some years ago saw. Um, uh, what she described as a black panther on the road in front of her one mm -hmm. night when she was on, you know, coming home. And um, she said there was no, there's no doubt what it was. It stopped and looked at her. And she said there was no doubt of the size of it. You know, this wasn't right. just a cat, you know? Yes, exactly. And uh, so, so they're, they're around, you know, the uh, most of, especially most of the Southern States, all of them, I uh, have something like this going on. Yeah. And, it, and I mean, you think of it, is it, is it a mutation, you know, or did someone get away and somehow it's bred and every once in a while mm -hmm. genetics will produce, you know, which is a black, you know, whatever the fur, which right. really is not black as if you look at it, it's just right. very dark gray. It just, but yeah, yeah. I, I mean, where did they reproduce from? Who knows? Uh, genetics is a weird thing as far as recessive genes for coloring, but yeah, I've heard of out here in Florida, especially my area, hunting's a big deal. So you get a lot of hunters. And I've heard a lot of them say, I have seen them. Exactly very similar to what you described with your wife. I've seen them on roads. I've seen them like crossing. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're like, around. Um, well, you know, jaguars were in this part of the country up until, yes. you know, just a, a, a few couple of thousand years ago. Maybe mm -hmm. they're still here, you know. Um, I mean, they crept back. I mean, it happens. Yes. Well, they just released wolves in Colorado. Yeah. Which, which all the ranchers are upset about <laughs> yeah. because you know they've released males and females, and um, yeah, and they'll you know they'll they'll be breeding soon, you know, and things like that. But the, the, the there's always um, let me ask you the um, because I know you've written with Edgar Rice Burroughs as far as Tarzan. People don't realize because everybody thinks of Tarzan. Let's go back to Johnny Weissmuller, which to me is the Tarzan. Sorry. He's the one that invented that, ah, you know, the vocalization. <laughs> Everybody's like that Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote a lot of other stuff besides Tarzan. And I mean, he had a bunch of, of ideas beyond what people think he had. Yeah. He, um, he wrote 24 Tarzan books. And mm -hmm. about a hundred novels in his lifetime. So wow. only twenty-four of those were Tarzan. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and he, um, his first books were the Martian books, uh, right? The John Princess Carter of books. Mars, or right, the John Carter yeah. books. Yes. And uh, then he went. He had Venus books that he wrote. Uh, he had books about um, a prehistoric world at the Earth's core. Um, wow. Uh, a prehistoric world. Uh, that was landlocked in, in Antarctica. That was a tropical place in Antarctica, um, the land of time forgot, mm -hmm. and um, and so on and so on. There's he he had a an endless imagination. Sure, um, sure. And uh, was the probably the most uh, the most uh, interesting thing about him to me, just as mm -hmm. as a writer, is that he was the very first American writer to um, successfully publish himself. Really? He did that? Uh, I did not know yeah. that. Yeah. There were several that tried, like Mark Twain tried to do it, and it didn't work mm -hmm. out for him. Uh, but uh, but Burroughs did it very successfully for over 20 years. And, uh, really? and I did not know created that. created Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated, which still exists, mm -hmm. and, that I write for sometimes. Okay. And, uh, and so it's, uh, yeah, he was an amazing fellow. Um, he had, by the way, um, very odd dreams. Uh, really? Why? When he was... Uh, uh, when he was writing all this stuff, uh, a, a reoccurring dream where he would wake up and there were these cloaked figures in hoods standing around his bed. Now, this would have been like in the, the 1930s and 40s. Mm -hmm. It was something he wrote to his children about later on when he got older. Okay. Uh, and so, and now, now we hear stuff about this, that kind of particular phenomenon a lot today. 
right. but uh, not so much back then. And he was, you know, he was not, he didn't seem to be uh, terribly interested in psychic phenomena or anything, although there's right. a lot of it in some of his stories. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but I always thought that was very interesting that he kind of had the, I guess what we, we would refer to today as the bedroom invader, you know, kind of yes, thing. Yes, yes. Right. And you, uh, you hear a lot of, uh, I was one time, uh, back when I was in Miami, I used to belong to this group where, you know, UFO kind of deals and, you know, awareness and everybody would get together and, and, uh, you know, after they would get people to come and do presentations, move on, whoever would come in. And, you know, afterwards, everybody breaks off and starts to talk. And I spoke to some of them. And since I was a hypnotist for many years, they would come up to me. And it was incredible. About five people told me about having not even visitate. First, as a UFO, they saw a UFO. And it dovetailed when they started having paranormal stuff happen in their house. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I want to say I had that conversation with about five people like 10 years ago. And I was like, what? I hadn't heard of that by, before that. You always thought of UFO over here, paranormal over there. Not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And they all, and then some of them did have what they said was what they thought that, that, that they had extraterrestrials coming to them. But all of them said, we, they themselves didn't understand that ever since they had had that UFO sighting, they would have paranormal stuff happening inside their home. Yeah, that like, was something that um, the John Keel um, yes. had investigated and figured out fairly early that he mm -hmm. said, anytime you're going to investigate a UFO sighting, he said, you know, when you're talking to the people who had the sighting, he said, also talk to their neighbors and just ask them, you know, if anything weird's going on. And he said, most of the time when he would do that, th there weren't usually anybody else that saw the UFO, right. but they would right. say, say things like, but, you know, suddenly a few nights ago, I think our house is haunted. You know, and things like right. that. And they would start seeing weird faces in the mirrors looking back at them and just God, weird stuff. Oh, God, you know, just like really crazy. weird. Uh, one guy described a, uh, a monitor lizard that would appear out of the wall and walk across the living room. And talk, think about this. I mean, Can you imagine this is your average person? I think I had a, a monitor like like a reptilian. Hello, whatever. Come out. of That's like that's far fetched. This is not like if you're going to make something up, that's way beyond. Yeah. So it's a very <laughs> strange thing to say, you know, if you're just going to yeah. make it up. Uh, but yeah, so there, there's, there seems to be definitely, I think, a connection, you know, mm -hmm. between the two, whether or not UFOs are extraterrestrial, I don't know. They might right, be something right. stranger. Oh, yeah. That. Oh, yeah. We, yeah. We, we're giving it. But, you know, and who was it the other day I was talking to? That I said, you know, before ufologists, it was like ghosts are over there, ufology over here, and uh, don't cross the streams kind of thing. And um, now there's people are realizing that sometimes there's a convergence. I've even had where there's been uh, UFO sightings and there's an uptick in cryptid sightings, mm -hmm. people that track that, you know, is it coincidence? Right. They, but the inference is that, no, it's more than coincidence. Why are you going to have UFO sightings? And then all of a sudden, supposedly, I, 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 um, I interviewed this gentleman. He passed away since then. He was running a Bigfoot group out of Alabama since the 70s. And he would tell me that after a while, people would have these sightings and they would call the police and the police, which what could they do? They would end up bringing the people to his house so that they could tell their story. Most of the time they had seen something like when they were driving because he lived like out in the rural Alabama. And he told me, Marlene, I don't know what these people saw, but whatever they saw, they thought it was a, it, it scared them enough. It, they weren't lying to me. They they weren't making stuff up. You could tell whether they mistook it for something, for something else, but whatever it was, they truly believed that it was something that he says, and most of these people around here are very familiar with wildlife. He says, there's, you know, as far as, was it a bear? No, it wasn't a bear. You know, that kind of deal, what everybody thinks. Um, and he said, yeah, that uh, he says, and he says, yeah, a couple of them wanted to, you know, ask his permission if they could stay at least parked in their car till they broke the daylight because they didn't want to like, that's how wigged out they were after seeing whatever it was that they saw. And all he could tell them was, is I've heard these stories before, you know, which to some people makes them feel better, but. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a, there's pretty doc, uh, pretty strong documentation that exists now that, that of a correlation between UFOs and Sasquatch or some, yes. or something that looks like Sasquatch anyway. I mean, there right, could be, right. again, it could be two different things. You know, maybe, 
Bigfoot is real and really is it is really a, an unknown primate. Although the, each year that goes by that we don't find one makes me doubt that more and more. But I right. still think it's possible. You know, uh, are not they very coming probable, but it's possible. You know, is uh, you know, are UFOs traveling inter or interdimensionally, and you know, Bigfoot either they're taking advantage of a portal opening, or maybe on purpose. Who knows? And they're coming well, maybe, in and out, and maybe that's why they're never found, or we can't yeah, find any I, type of. Uh, I don't know. Stan, Stan Gordon has written a, a couple of really good books on that, where he's really, um, he's really followed that up, and he's he makes a lot of, he makes a lot of the UFO guys mad, and he makes a lot of the Bigfoot guys mad because they don't like to mix the two. And the oh, fact no. of the matter is, if you follow the evidence, sometimes this is what happens. Yes. You know, yes. and if you ignore it, that's not you're not going to get anywhere. You know, you're exactly. just not. Exactly, and, and it's not, and it's not just you know, um, big hairy primates. Sometimes it, lake monsters are involved in this too, with yes. UFO sightings, ghosts, yes. um, cryptids um, of know, different types, werewolf you get, kind of things, all kinds of oh, things. dog men are like, said, man, I'll take a big foot any day over dog man. I think if I saw a dog, which by the way, I, I as a hypnotist, I did have people have sightings that would call me up. Because they, and this is what I think that happens to these people. When you see something like this, your world goes like this. Your your reality, and, and then of course it's not only that, but it's like if this can exist, what else is there mm -hmm. that should not exist? Because let's face it, you go to the movies, the credits roll. I was great, you know. Even if you jumped in your seat, it's scary, but you know that that's not reality. But when you see something like this, so I had. Um, through the years, I had people, I had one that was, he was totally wigged out. Another one that wanted me to erase his memory because people want to go back to the not knowing the, I want to be the person I was before I saw this. I want to unsee it. And it's like, sorry, <laughs> there is no such thing, you know, unless it's amnesia, like on your part, but I can't, I can't hypnotize you into forgetting that. So, but th this, this plays such havoc with their their world they're living sure yeah. that they they were even time after that happened they they were like this was the demarcation point for them like the you know before and the after everything changed for them after they saw what they saw okay and these people that weren't calling me there was there was nothing to be gained from calling me and telling me this or you know and uh trouble sleeping uh trouble going outdoors after dark uh you name it you name it. And these were, um, they were all, they were all happened to be men. And I mean, none of these guys came across as being like, then they were normal people and they just couldn't grasp that reality. They, for them, it was like, I, how can I continue seeing this? And it's like, and of course the fear was I'm going to encounter this again. All right. And, uh, yeah, yeah it was, it's, it's, Again, I can't vouch and say absolutely that what they saw is what they saw, but whatever it is that they saw did a number on them big time. You know, um, I had one guy, uh, he used to, he wouldn't like, uh, he used to work security, uh, like he normally would work, which is when he saw it, he usually would work a security, but at night, uh, taking care of, you know, where they have like uh, construction sites or big machinery. And he says that that he did that for a while and he was really good because he says other guards would fall asleep and he never fell asleep. And he said he was great, never had a problem, never was scared, never worried until he saw something. And after that, he says, you know, he would never work again, like after dark. And he and he never even he says, even if they put me in the middle of the city, like, you know, he says normally that company, what they would do is if, you know, the they had heavy machinery they would sit somebody out there overnight. He says, never again. And he says, he says, it's incredible when you have that, you're an automatic. Once you start seeing the sunset, something happens to you that you're aware of that. Whereas before you wouldn't care if it was sunset or what I think that no, they become, uh, their world is ruled by this event. And I had another guy, he took up, he took up smoking after not smoking for 35 years after what seeing what he wow. saw, you know, and um, yeah. So as far as there's a lot of stories out there, like you said, of people that you're never. And by the way, I want to say with the exception of like 
two of them, they had not told the other ones. They had not told anybody about this. Nobody, nobody knew. This that's usually how it anything. is. You know, that's usually how it is. Nobody wants to talk about it. They, they hadn't told family, friend, nobody knew about it. Yeah. And I think that and there were, I think a lot of them were just like, you know, when you're at your rope send, like I need, I either I need to sleep or I want you to make me forget <laughs> one of those deals or something that it was. And I didn't really know them. And, um, and I told them, and, and believe it or not, one, one of them I already had, when he told me his story, you could tell he's one of, he was talking to me on the phone. You know, he's, you could tell he was ready for me to go, Oh, are you kidding? You're crazy. You know? <laughs> I said, no, I, I believe me, I've heard a lot of like out there stuff. I go, and after I said, do you know, I've heard of that before. And he goes, really? You know, he was like, oh, <laughs> you know, I go, yes. I go, I don't know what it is. I can't tell you, but you know, I've had other people tell me they've had similar experiences to that. And you could tell this person's voice changed like, yeah, I go, yeah, sure. I go. And because they, you get kind of self-isolate, like thinking I'm the only one, the universe is picking on me. <laughs> like, why me? Why did you get me to see this? Um, and yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of stories out there of people that, that some of them will take it to their grave. They'll no, never tell anybody um, what they've seen. And let me ask you, just out of curiosity, do you think that, um, and I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with all these disappearances in the national parks. Do you think there's any tie in to any of this stuff as far as either ETs or Bigfoot or cryptids or even a portal? Um, I'm inclined to, to, to think that my answer would be yes, <laughs> all mm -hmm. of that, yeah. you know, um, it's, it's very strange. I mean, and, and yeah. until you, I mean, I've, I've tried to, to bring the subject up a couple of times to other writer friends of mine that, that aren't particularly interested in this stuff. Mm -hmm. And once you, you start to really dig into this though, you start right. to see how really unusual and mystifying yeah. it really is. Um, mm -hmm. and this, these are things that are like on government records and so forth. You know, I mean, there, yes. there's, this is all documented. It's not somebody just telling you a story, you know? So yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going on, you know? Well, Imagine you know, some I of think, it is. Yeah. You know, because some of, some of them, you know, that are people that, you know, sometimes let's face it, there's people that do go out there to get lost on purpose. They're suicidal and, you know, or right. they legitimately become lost or things like that. But some of these circumstances are like very unusual yeah like 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 four people on a trail and you turn around and the guy behind you and you talk to him for a second and then you look back again a minute later and he's gone right like and you can't find him anywhere and he's gone right, and you would think this person would say hey or you would hear something i mean and occasionally they leave their shoes which i find interesting yes. and they um and in some of the, if they're ever found and i've heard that even the ones that have been found their memory is like they can't recall what where they were from the time they disappeared till the time, even if sometimes it's miles, miles away or same thing with children that they've, they found them in places like there's no way, let's say a toddler or a child can go right. to where yeah. uphill, you know, through the snow kind of thing. Um, yeah. They're very, it's, it's very, very strange. It's very puzzling and very disturbing too. Sure. It's, it's something that's been going on a long time. Obviously we're just now starting to pay attention to it. Yes. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very odd. When I was, uh, when I was about nine years old, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, I saw, uh, to all intents and purposes, the flying saucer. It okay. wasn't just me. It was with uh, some other cousins of mine. Okay. And, uh, it was in a rural place in, in Kentucky. All and right. uh, we were um, out in the backyard of this farmhouse. And suddenly one of my other cousins pointed um kind of off in the distance we all turned to look and there it was you know i mean i it, it was a hollywood flying saucer you know okay with the, with the dome the whole thing the, the i don't remember everything. any portholes or anything like that but a couple of my cousins said that they did but i don't remember okay like that. so we stood there and watched it for a while for for you know a few seconds and it would glide back over like you know this the tree line was here and it would mm -hmm. glide back to where you couldn't see it anymore Okay. And then and then we think, what the what what you know? And then right. we come back, you know. It was probably only about 50, 60 yards from us. It looked like it was roughly the size of an average house. Okay. I'd say, um, and uh, we tried our 
we tried our damnedest to get the adults in the house to come out and look. They were in there right. playing cards. They would not. It was like, now these kids. Yeah, not a single one of them would even look out the window. And it was just, it's almost like a dream, you know, but it really happened. You know, what is um, it like the, like the movies, the horror movies, nobody pays attention to the kid. Right. And, and one of my cousins, I remember she, she took it very hard. Just looking at the thing, she started crying. I, bet, I, yeah. I never felt threatened by it. I don't remember being scared by it, but I was awed. You know, yeah, of course. Truly. This is like, yeah. I, I and, still don't know what it was. You know, well, but, I've had uh, two people I've talked to that they worked. One was a guy that worked on oil rigs out in Texas, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> two, two, two different people that basically this middle out of nowhere, that they, they, they have some significant sightings out there, not expecting to see anything. And it's like, what's out there? Nothing. Okay. You know, um, because you know, you always hear these stories, of course, they're close to uh, either cities or the, there was nothing out there. Like, this is the middle of nowhere, Texas. And they had sightings, really up close sightings of things that, and what's really, and more than one person has told me that they've, uh, this was more modern times. You know, when you can buy those, you know, those laser lights that they shone the laser lights out of, and it, it, this gets the attention of the, the, the UFO big time. It'll like, and there was one guy, I, this, this, this was, I read the story. He was out in Colorado. There's an area, I think, in Colorado where they have a lot of UFO sightings. But same thing, out in the middle of nowhere kind of deal. And him and his brother-in-law went out there. And his brother-in-law had bought all these fancy, like, uh, binoculars and cameras and all this stuff. And they went out there. And he says one time they see something far off. And he got one of those lasers. But it must have been a long. And they started blinking it. And he said that thing went from, it shot up to where they were. And they wigged out and they left, you know, and then when they got further away, it, they didn't see it anymore. And they flashed a laser at it again and it came up and then they left. And then they were like, in other words, then after a while, he says he got the binoculars and he could see it. But he says that when he would look with his naked eye, he couldn't see it. Almost like mm -hmm. let's let Star Trek, the cloaking, like a cloaking kind of thing. Mm -hmm. He was telling his brother, he goes, it's right there. And his brother-in-law was looking and goes, I don't see anything. He goes, it's right there. You know? And then it was one of those things, you know, once you catch it, what are you going to do with it? You know, you got its attention. And then I think they, <laughs> his brother-in-law, which was a little bit older than him, had brought him along. He was like a teenager. You know, said, I think he rethought the plan, like, okay, what do I do now? Now that I, you know, you go out there, like, you want to see the ghost, and then you see the ghost, and then you go out there looking for the UFO, and you got it. And he says that they spoke to some of the people that lived and they all said that it was, it was, it was very, Oh yeah, we see lights and we see stuff all the time out there. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. What are you going to do when does it catch the tiger by the tail? And there it is. Well, things are, uh, are things are thankfully in the last few years have become a bit more open in regard oh, to yeah. that particular thing, which is, which is good. People mm -hmm. can talk about it now without being made too fun of. And oh, no, uh, before there was a big stigma. Yeah, yeah, know. there was. And, and I'm glad to see that that's actually dissolved quite a bit. Um, one thing that I, I would like to, to see happen in, you know, I guess baby steps, you know, mm -hmm. but um, it's, it, it's pretty much now, you know, the government is saying, okay, yeah, we don't know what they are. They're not ours. They're not theirs. We don't know what they are. Um, but we see them, you know, the, the, the military sees them all the time. Well, it's not just the military seeing these. Oh, yeah. Um, but I'm waiting for the day. I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime. But I'm waiting for the day when they actually start saying, you know, let's talk about the occupants when they land. Because that happens all the time, too. And, you, and nobody's yeah. mentioned that yet, you know, in, in terms of this, you know, the New York Times article and so forth. It's like, yeah. Right. You know, UFOs are real, uh, or and, and they're unknown. They're mysterious. We don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. But nobody's talking about the ones that land and things get out, and that's sure. happening too. And it's, and it's happened for a very long time. Yeah. Um, I think Jacques Vallée suggested one time that it was happening mm -hmm. something like ten thousand times a year in Europe. Yes. Yes. And yes. that's only the ones that people described. So the ones that, yeah, the ones that didn't talk about it, it's hard to say. <laughs> There was a gentleman I was talking to, same thing with the cattle mutilations that, you know, they were having. And he says that 
he had gone out to meet with some ranchers and that it had become such a norm that up to a certain point, and, and he says that the, 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 you could tell the way the, the cattle was mutilated. It was, this is not a predator. And as a matter of fact, what they do is they take the least valuable part of the cattle, the tongue, the, the anus, the, the, the if you, no, in other words, if you're going to take the meat, you know, and it, he says, this is not a predator. And he says, as a matter of fact, a lot of times predators will not come clear close to that mm -hmm. carcass. Okay. Because they say right. usually when a cattle dies, the ranchers just leave it there because they know, you know, all the predators will come around and basically decimate it. They don't drag it off and bury it. And he says that some of these things will lie up there. And nobody comes near it. And he was talking to some ranchers and he says that some of them up to, they're up to a certain point. They kind of see it as that. He was like, aren't you curious? Don't you want to know what, what is this? You're losing money. And that some of them have gotten to the point that they're like, Hey, it is what it is. And he goes, I don't know if it's you're just, or they've heard through the grapevine, like don't go. In one case, I remember I, I read that they, uh, they did do, they took tissue they sent it off to a lab to see if there was any disease. Okay, was this something that made the... No, there was no disease. However, it did have... The animal did have barbiturates in its bloodstream or in the tissue, which is like... Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> how's how's a cattle going to get barbiturates in it? That's weird. It's... Yeah. And... Um, they it's, just, a, it's a very sinister phenomenon. And yes. it's... it's uh, there's to me there's no other way to look at it than it's a it's a form of terrorism because they're wanting yeah. these cows to be found sure. you know uh, now if this was if this was the government or some other agency mm -hmm. just experimenting with with cows like this you know it's easy enough to find like there's lots of private land or even government land where we would never know this was going on at all sure yeah, you just know. but just no, let the they, cattle loose in there, you know. Whatever. Yeah, they're want, they're wanting this stuff to be found. I yes. I don't know what the solution of it is. It it could again be several different things um, going on. It's I don't know. And then I'm thinking to myself, okay, if we go with the uh, ET version. It's like how many cattle do you need to mutilate to find out whatever it is you're trying to find out? Supposedly, yeah. I mean, by now with your advanced technology, which I we assume you have, can't you just scan it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, I have a tendency. The, the longer this goes on, the I have a tendency to, to more and more doubt an unearthly explanation. It, it seems like, I don't know. To me, it, it kind of reeks of human, humans to yeah. a degree. Yeah. Um, Weak people out. But, a bit. but still, it's unexplainable. And, and what are the motives? And I, I don't know what's going. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's just very, very troubling. Uh, and it's another yeah. thing that's been going on for a very long time. Yes. You know? Even though from what I, I, I did hear though, that it did peak in the seventies, but I mean, it's been happening ever since, but it happened mm -hmm. where they say that normally you do get, you know, you, you lose animals. This is part of having cattle, be the predators mm -hmm. or they get sick and they die, sure. but stuff like this, where they mutilate in a certain specific way, like you could tell this is not, this is not a normal stuff again. And by the way, from what I understand, some of these cattle are worth a couple of thousand bucks a head. They're, they're it's not like yeah. I just lost a chicken and oh well, <laughs> let me go get another one. They yeah. they're valuable, they're valuable animals. Right. Which is, and I'm sure you've heard of the Skinwalker Ranch, which is sure. Sure. the people that were there, the last, well, the last family. How's this? That were there, I believe they were having problems because they lost a bunch of their cattle. Yeah, they to did. Some of they the phenomena. basically. Yeah, they went bankrupt, I think, if I remember right. And yeah, they basically they gave like, it up. Yeah. yeah, they couldn't maintain the 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 thing. And uh, what was it when they, they wrote that book, which they do detail that hitchhiker effect where people that were there and people don't realize it wasn't just the the scientists. They said anybody that was on there, even security personnel that really weren't in the investigation, they were just on that land. All of them had some type of hitchhiker effect different versions of it but back home to the point that some of them didn't come back i think somebody compared notes and go did that happen to you that oh yeah okay right that's it you know so and i think that's one of the first times that you that i've actually seen written about the ufo et slash paranormal being all part of the same thing yeah and there's there's a um, cryptid uh <clears throat> a cryptid involvement with that too we're often um something cat-like that's seen in the trees crawling around. Oh, God, I that, heard that. Uh, and I was like... Yeah. 
um, that sometimes can only be slightly seen, kind of like the way the the predator in, in the movie Predator, the way that one yes. kind of yes. has a invisibility cloak or whatever. Um, and then there's also, a, a, I think, a Skinwalker in particular. There's a Bigfoot connection with that too. It's yeah. like it's all the same stuff, you know. Um, then you but, hear that the that even before this land was. I mean, the, 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 I think it's the Utes. I, I don't know which tribe it is that's in that area. They were like, don't go there. Utes that's and the Navajo. Yeah. yeah, the Navajos, that this area was like Skinwalker, which for them is black witch, dark witchcraft. You know, um, yeah. that Real was bad like, fellow. <laughs> well, and this is, I tell everybody, you know, natives usually, all you had to tell them was, don't go there. Don't go to that river. Don't go to that mountain. Don't go to that land. Okay, I'm not going. Right. We're the ones that have to go out there and figure out what is out there, you know? And that's, you know, and from what I understand, the UFO sightings there go back decades, even yeah. before, you know, that there was a high school teacher out there that uh, was doing like his informal kind of reporting where he would interview people. And it they, they've had stuff being seen for quite a while back out there, you know? And everybody says, well, you know, around the 50s, which is when the flying saucer thing came out, you know, and Cold War. And I was like, mm, I don't know. I don't think that really accounts for what some of the things that people have seen. The ones that have actually talked about it, that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think that, you know, there's a certain amount of, of mass hysteria during that time, for sure. But uh, it doesn't answer every single, every single, you know, case um, no. at all, even, even if just one of them you know, was, was something different. That's yeah. extraordinary, you know, so. But even um, the gentleman in 1947, Mac Brazell, he was the one that found the original, whatever it was out there. They say that the rest of his life, he was, he said that was like the biggest mistake he had made. He had, he says that if he had to do it again, he would never have picked it up and taken it. I guess, I don't know if the scrutiny that came with it, it was like not worth it. He thought he was doing something good. Yeah, and hardly anybody seems to profit from this stuff, you know. No, no, it, it no. It just doesn't no. happen. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It and doesn't. the ones that do profit from it, I'm highly suspect of. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I know. Sometimes, it's, I hate to say it, sometimes it's like, you know, be, everybody now is be, becoming abductee or contacting. And it's like, mm, okay. But people that it's like unusual stuff, like, I don't see you as the abductee type. I don't know what to call it, but, you no, know. I, no, anybody who's making who's beginning rich off of it and who thinks and who says that they know yes. exactly what's going on. I'm suspect. Yeah. Now. Of course. And I don't think anybody really knows. Don't trust. They, can suspect. they could have an idea. They could have a theory. Yeah. They're selling something. Uh, sure. Of course. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. No, most of the people, like you said, it's been to their detriment, whether, you know, I mean, we go with conspiracies, like you're not supposed to talk about it, you know, and even, you know, they've had these people that after they leave the military, they'll say, well, I saw this and I saw that. And some of them, I believe. And, but this guy, this Mac Brazel guy in 47, when he came across that afterwards, he, he, they said that, um, I was reading one part where if you, after, after the fact, if you ever talked to him, he says normally he was a very nice man, but if you ever brought up the subject, he was like, it was very brusque. Like, we're not going to talk about that. Like, you want to close down a conversation, you bring that up. And he would like, no, that this was a bad thing for him to have come across it. What, what in reality was out there? Who knows? You know, <laughs> we will find out. Let me ask you, are you, well, I know that you were saying in the bio that you're working on some graphic novels now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, <clears throat> this, this recently came out. Uh, it's about oh, the. Let me, uh, let me see if I can get a good shot of it. There you go. Can, yes. Yeah, there we go. It's the um, the uh, Calvin Parker story in okay. Pascagoula, uh, Mississippi. Yes, 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 yes. The one in Pascagoula. Yes. Yeah, and and he participated in this. This was this was with his. Uh, okay. His approval. Didn't the older gentleman already pass away? Or uh, am I making? Yes. It? Yes, okay. and uh, Calvin himself passed away a couple months ago too. Really? Okay. Yeah, okay. Did. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. And what did, did you, how did, did you talk to him about it? What did, what did he tell you as far as? Um, we, we, ch we chatted several times. He, he wrote his own book, um, Calvin did, mm -hmm. um, that, um, uh, that I highly recommend. It's about this thick. It's huge. <laughs> okay. And, um, uh, and so I based the, the graphic novel off of that. 
um, he became good friends with uh, Philip Mantle, who runs Flying Saucer Press in England. Okay. And uh, Philip contacted me. Um, we didn't know each other then because okay. he had seen me make posts on Facebook and knew that I was a writer and I was interested in this kind of stuff. Okay. And uh, so, um, you know, I, I agreed to do it um, pretty quickly, actually, even though at the time I was really swamped and had no time to do it, but I managed to do it anyway. <laughs> Um, somehow it took me a year, a year and a half to write it. And, and I was only working on it. I was only able to work on it on half days on Sundays. So it took a long time to do it, but, uh, but I'm glad we did it together. And, um, it was something that, uh, everything that I would write, I would run past Calvin, make sure that it was mm -hmm. what he intended. And, um, right. I didn't want to embellish anything. I wanted it to be absolutely his story. And uh, and so he uh, so he had to say about everything. And you let me know, ask you, what 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 was his? I know it's my same. What was the effect of this on him after the rest oh, of? Oh, it had an awful effect on him. He uh, okay. He the way he described it to me was he said, you know, there was a because when this actually happened, it's what seventy three, I think, mm -hmm. in October. It was a big deal. It was in newspapers all across the country. Uh, all over the world, probably. Right. And he, um, he said that, you know, he, well, for one thing, he got fired from his job. He did. <laughs> and, yeah. And, oh, uh, man. he was just 22 at the time, you know, yeah, he was a young guy. Just, had just gotten married and he, so he would go from job to job and work there for a while until somebody recognized him. Wow. And then he'd have to quit because the, the, the press would show up at his jobs and he would be fired or whatever, or, or he'd have to get end up quitting. And this went on for 20 years, you know, it never really let up. And he wow. would have to, uh, he, he would have to sometimes work jobs under assumed names mm -hmm. and, and so forth. And uh, finally he went to a, a, a friend's funeral and there in at the, at the funeral itself, somebody came up to him that he didn't know and said, are you the, the Calvin Parker that that's that was kidnapped by Martians? Oh boy. You know, and he just said that that'd been enough, you know. And so he went home and and his wife, um, Calvin's wife told him, she said, you know, if you were to write your own story, at least everyone would know what happened. Because right. the newspapers that would be constantly reprinting each other and so forth, the got were getting a lot of the details wrong right from the start. Right. And so uh, so Calvin decided to do that ultimately. And he mm -hmm. did. And one of the deals that he had with Philip is he said, I'll write the book. Philip wanted to publish it. And Calvin mm -hmm. said, I'll write the book. But I have I have one condition. He said, I don't want a single word of it to be changed. He said, I know I'm not a writer. I'm not. No, I know I'm not good at this. I don't have much education. He said, mm -hmm. but I, I, I don't want a single word changed. That way, I know for sure it's my story. And, I mean, it's understandable and, and it's actually it's actually um you know quite a fun read i mean it, it is very much in calvin's language you know it's like mm -hmm. you're talking to him right and uh and uh i enjoyed it quite a lot but it, it was like it was a um a very satisfying project to do um the case his case is a lot more involved than people know i mean uh j ellen Hynek was involved with it really uh, as, as well as um um several other um, like Stanton Friedman, fellows like mm -hmm. that, Bud Hopkins um, were involved, all involved in this case over the years. They all knew Calvin and had, had followed this. He was, um, as he got older, he told me he was starting to accept it more as far as uh, realizing, look, this is something happened to me. I can't get away from it. You know, yeah. I may as well. Did he you know, ever, did he ever tell you why he thought, was it just that they were at the wrong place at the wrong time or was yeah, he he didn't seem to think that there was anything special about him or the other fellow mm -hmm. Charles Hickson. He said, "I just think that we were there and there they were, and right, that's what happened." And he, and Calvin was never sure what they were either. He never said that they were aliens. He okay. never said that the UFO was a spaceship. He described okay. what he saw, and he said, "I don't know what they were." He said um, sure. that he had did have some religious friends of his that were trying to convince him that they were demons. And he said, I don't right. believe that either. He said, right. he said, I don't know what it was, but sure. they were real. 
At least he was honest about it. And people, you know, there is such a thing. It's okay to say, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, I think if, I think all of us really should be so honest as to say, we don't know yes. because we don't, I mean, there's nobody who really truly knows, you know, there's mm -hmm. people who have experienced things, but we often don't know what we're experiencing. No, you know, we, we don't no. know what that thing is. That's looking at us through the window, you know? Sure. Okay. Okay. It looks like what's described as a Sasquatch, but what is a Sasquatch? You know, right. It's true. So, is it, are we talking an interdimensional being or are we talking, like you said, a primate or just a regular unknown species of earth animal, whatever. Yeah. It, yeah. it could be. I mean, why not? Which, which seems, you know, more and more unlikely to me, but uh, you, you would think, you know, like, especially during the seventies, you know, Bigfoot was a big deal in the seventies Yes, and you would, any Bigfoot enthusiast at the time, myself included when I was in my teens would have thought by now, we'd surely have one in a zoo, you know? Well, you know, but, it, it, the, the thing, and it's really funny because, but then when you look, you see in the literature that historically there have been references to what sounds like a Bigfoot type creature. That's true. You that know? has happened a few times. That's true. That's true. You know, the, um, and I, I just, uh, there's a biology, a uh, biologist friend of mine that's mm -hmm. made an interesting point too about this he says that uh, he said you know the you can go through the the forest you know every day and you'll never find a dead deer or a dead bear hardly ever mm -hmm. so, you know it's not impossible but it's it's rare he said but and if whatever if this if sasquatch is real he said right. it must be something very very rare and he said you know the most the most prevalent mammal in North America is the brown bat. There are literally billions of them. And have you ever seen a dead bat laying anywhere? Nope. It's like, no. He said, so who's to say? Yeah, no. Between, I think that between insects and predators and just weather, mm -hmm. everything kind of like this scatters. I mean, soft tissue is gone quickly. You know, and then what's left eventually, if, especially if it's in the middle of, you know, where what they consider Bigfoot territory, which is the middle of nowhere. I mean, good luck on uh, I'm finding evidence of that. Right. Well, I, I started taking um, the Sasquatch problem a little bit more seriously when I was in, in college uh, studying paleontology, because there are things in the fossil record very much like them. And so... Okay. So at least at one time we know something like that existed. Really, it was real. Okay. Um, there's there's a a giant ape, um, the the largest primate that probably ever lived, that's called Gigantopithecus. Right. Uh, that lived in China and actually in the shadow of Everest, actually in Tibet. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the that's where the Yeti stories came the from. Yeti. Uh, and yes. it seems to have only become extinct about uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 hundred thousand years ago. So it was very human close, beings would have been counted. Yes. Uh, or right. are they extinct? You know, so there's, right, that you go there's, down so that there's road. something there um, of where this possibly came from um, in, in terms of at least uh, the story, the folklore of it. Whether or not it's a really living, breathing animal, I don't know. As a matter of fact, that would be, you would think, the areas, like they say in Siberia, that you would possibly be able to find some type of proof would be in some area like that. You know, like they've found these mammoths and everything that basically they're frozen. They're, from what I understand, they're intact. Yeah. Um, some of them still have what they were eating in their mouths. Yeah. Yes. And, so they were frozen uh, very I mean, quickly. Do you, do you, I've heard that, and, I, and, I, and I'm very much on the fence of this because it sounds very Jurassic part where they're going to try to basically clone them, take the, what they can from some, because some of the tissue is so good that they're going to try to basically uh, recreate it. And I was like, uh, I don't yeah. know how I feel about that. Yeah, I, I'm, it always, it always surprises my friends when I, when I, um, when I describe my displeasure at that idea, because they're always go, "Why, you know, you of all people, wouldn't you want to see a real living mammoth?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I would, but I don't want this to happen because, right? For one thing, it's going to be an exploited animal. Yes, um, elephants all over the world, all, all three species of elephants, are are endangered. Mm -hmm. uh, 
may become extinct within the next, you know, in the wild within the next, you know, 50 right. years. Yep. Poachers and stuff like that. Yes. So there's that. So if we mm -hmm. if we clone mammoths, for one thing, what are we going to do with them? You sure. know, where are they going to where are they going to be? And something that a lot of people aren't thinking about. We don't really know still why the megafauna of the of the last ice age vanished. It mm -hmm. could be that in, in bringing back a mammoth, we're going to bring back a virus that we have no control over. Sure. Uh, because exactly. these mass extinctions, a lot of times have virus kind of written all over them. Yeah, um, either, because they're very either, either the animal or their food. They're, yeah, they're very selective extinctions. It's like like not mm -hmm. everything became extinct, just certain things yes. you know, here yes. and there. That it kind of like cherry picks it. Uh, so for for that reason alone, I don't I wouldn't want to see yes a cloned mammoth. Now they're they're trying to do the same thing with dinosaurs, although that's going to be a, a tougher nut to crack. But what they're but what is easier, and I'm afraid is going to happen too, because this will again be just another exploited animal for money. As I know that there is there is experiments going on right now that paleontologist Jack Horner is involved in, which I'm against, of basically um, genetically altering a chicken to look like a dinosaur. And this can that be goes done. along that theory that that's what they became. That basically ch birds are were once. Yeah, you know, birds. Yeah, living birds are dinosaurs. Right. Uh, they're not even. They're they're descendants oh of the God, dinosaurs, but they're dinosaurs themselves. They're theropod uh, dinosaurs. Now, like birds, for example, still have the gene for teeth. It's just turned off. Uh, they still have the gene for 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 long tails, and it's also turned off. They can switch these genes on now, and so you can have birds with teeth. You can have birds with long tails. You can have birds with scales instead of feathers. There's lots of things that could be done. It's you probably think that, that if they've if they've turned them off, it's because they don't use them or they don't need them. In other words, yeah, I imagine they adapt to their environment. So right, right. Um, um, it's not a it's not a good idea. <laughs> I, and I've also heard that. Well, I've read. What am I? I haven't heard it. That they were saying, well, because obviously these animals became extinct, but they were saying they were looking at the Tasmanian tiger that was hunted into extinction. As in, this animal didn't become extinct because of whatever you know, right. the climate or they couldn't eat or whatever. They were hunted. And again, I'm like, ah, a little bit on the fence. And uh, yeah. from what I understand, also cloned animals, they don't, they don't live that long. This is people. Think, no, no, uh, no, it's not, it's, there's, a, there's all kinds of problems that come yes, with it. Health -wise. Yes. It's, uh, it's quite inhumane. Uh, yes, actually. exactly. Exactly. It's it like, no, there is no such thing as a perfect duplicate you know, the original is the original. And I was surprised to learn, which a lot of people, I, that, you know, that there's people that have gotten their pets cloned. You know, that this is more common. You know, you think of it, some movie stuff. And from what I understand, if you've got the the, the pockets for it, you can get your pet cloned. And I've lost pets and it's been very, but sure. I would never want to. No. I wouldn't want and like, and that's like, that's more like really what you're getting in that in that instance is more like a twin brother or sister of the animal that you had. Yeah. Um, and usually they're open to a lot of disease and things too. They yeah. won't live probably half as long. Yes. And, um, and there's all that. I understand the sentiment attached to it. Sure. But uh, but no, I I sometimes, um, I mean, I have had dogs and cats that I would dearly love to see again. Maybe I will sure. again someday. Who knows? Sure. You know, in a different way. But um, but I think that would be a selfish thing to do, honestly. Sure, it is. that. That's one of those things where, you know, they say when you know you lose an animal, you go. I mean, I've been tempted sometimes like when you're hurting to go and get another one. It's like, no, I don't want to dishonor their memory that way. You know, it's like if I get another one eventually down the road, but not as a replacement. How's that? No, not, not as a rebound. Replacement. But I think you I think, you know, getting like when if you feel a dog that passes away. I think you know adopting an, another dog sure someday is a is a is a fine tribute to that actually sure. I believe, you know, so. believe me and a lot uh when i rescued one she came pregnant <laughs> it was like one of those deals where somebody had posted a pet on uh, one of these sites and they were like they were trying to find it they, they said look we've i called them up and i said look and I had one of my dogs pass away i said this was a few months afterwards I said, if you can't find the owner 
and you can't keep her. Let me know. Sure enough, like three weeks later, they called me. They said, look, we took her. She chipped, but there's no, she's well-groomed, but, and we put up posters in the neighborhood. We can't find, we can't keep her. So I said, okay, I'll go pick her up. And she, about three or four weeks later, I'm looking at her and I'm like, she was not a fat little dog, but she started to bulge out in the middle. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> what? So yeah, I got several for the price of one. Yeah. And then I kept, it was one of those deals. Like, yeah, the, the gift that keeps on giving, but uh, yeah, the, um, I think that, that, uh, you know, stuff like that, you, you have to deal with it. You know, and I, I, when I read that, I was like, they're actually cloning pets. I was like, that's a first. So <laughs> yeah. And then let me tell you, something. I have a lot of chickens. I could tell you they are like little velociraptors. <laughs> I'm, I'm, everybody thinks chicken world or chicken kingdom is savage mm -hmm. it is savage god knows i know because and i've i've raised all my chickens i've you know either i i, I hatched them and but uh, they're they're all mine even my roosters and everything and nobody has any idea you look at a chicken and you think oh the chicken is like yeah the chicken yeah, and those chickens can be savage with each other or anybody that hasn't been chased by a rooster hasn't lived yet. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I know my roosters. They, they all, oh, no, they all know me. Sometimes when they fight, I'm like, cut it out. And you see my husband, what? And I go, no, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the chicken. Cut it out, you guys. I mean, in, in general. Me. They look at I me like, of, oh, <laughs> the I lady that feeds us is mad. <laughs> I had a lot of cousins that lived on farms and so forth. So I was around animals like that all the time. Uh -huh. And for the most part, they left us alone. But there, I had an aunt that had one rooster in particular that I, that was just pure yeah. evil, you know, and he would, he would uh, pick, pick one <laughs> of us out to go after, you know? And so we were just hoping it wasn't going to be, it wasn't going to be us. Oh no, I, I got, yeah, I got, um, I have also, uh, I bought like, I have like a flock of 15 guineas because, you know, I love the noise they make. They're so quiet. Not really, but they're very good at eating these things. And man, they pick on those roosters. They got everybody all of a sudden. The roosters are like, oh, oh, here come the guineas. Oh no. I mean, yeah, they're yeah, it's like this, this, this whole you know thing going on in there in the farmyard because I mean I'm on acreage, but I also have a pen, a big giant area for them. But yeah, it's like yeah, it's like watching they've got their their own soap opera thing going on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so okay, it has been absolutely wonderful to speak to you, Martin. I have enjoyed oh. this so much. Oh, me too, me too. Yeah, it's been great to talk to you. I yeah, mean, thank you for asking me. No, on the contrary, and I hope you're going to come back. And um, sure. you said you just finished this book. When when was that book released? The one from for Pascal? Oh gosh, uh, when was it released? Um, I think it was in October. I believe. Okay. Around Halloween. Okay. I believe. Okay, that was just um, a recent. Yeah, I, I'm writing an, uh, another one now about Mothman, so that's going oh on. Oh right my now. god! So. I went, I went down to, I went and I took my picture in front of the Mothman mm -hmm. um, statue, and it's, people don't realize this town is really small. You know, yeah, yeah it's a tiny little place. It's, it's a tiny little place, and you know, you got the river, and then you're on the other side in Ohio, and, um, yeah, it's that's that's. And then, you know, they've had a bunch of humanoid kind of like uh, sightings out of Chicago and sure. weird places, yeah. O'Hare. Yeah, that seems to be the place now. And yeah. believe it or not, there was a, well, maybe a year over Chernobyl, mm -hmm. which I thought was really interesting. Um, so is it, you know, it's, is it is, is yeah, it it's, portend it's, or disaster or what? Yeah, it's it seems to be kind of a global thing. You know, it's it's yes. it's. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the statue there in Point Pleasant, I'm not quite sure why it was sculpted that way, because it looks nothing like what people I are know, describing. I know, I know. <laughs> like, I know. But, but, but for, you know, in its favor, though, almost everybody that I've ever talked to that are like, you know, living Mothman witnesses, mm -hmm. describe it a little different. I think that right. you, I think that the, the witness puts a little bit of themselves into it, if you know what sure. I mean. Um mm -hmm. I don't think that if Mothman exists, I don't think there's any way this is like a cryptid or a living animal. This is something really weird. Sure. Um, yeah. No, I, there's you know, nothing them, that you can mistake it. For that no, for it's, that. it's not a sandhill crane. No. <laughs> oh, you I was about to say the stork. You know, it's not a stork or something yeah. like that. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, I mean, most of them don't even describe a head. You know, they just That's describe that the eyes seem to be on its chest like this. You right. Know, and, and it's That's it's just really a really weird. weird thing. Some people describe arms. Some some say there's no arms, just wings. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a little different 
depending on who sees it. Um, exactly. And is it like, people, is it, are we talking different versions of the same thing? Yeah, I, I think that, I, you know, it seems to be kind of an archetype idea anyway of like a, for for want of a better term, kind of an angel of death kind of thing, you know. Sure, yeah. It, that's what it kind of seems to be. And it scares the hell out of people, but it doesn't seem to really hurt anybody, you know, so. Right, right. Unless you think of it, well, as like, you know, like in the Mothman movie that basically it was giving people a heads up of a disaster that yes. seems to be yeah. almost unavoidable. Yeah, and that may in itself be benign, though, you know, yeah. like, if, why don't you people understand what I'm trying to tell you? <laughs> sure, exactly. And we just, exactly. We're, we're too dumb to figure it out, you know. Yeah, so. It's like the banshee effect, you know, like, yeah. it's going to happen no matter what. It's just letting you, giving you a heads up. Yeah. But, yeah, that, uh, I, I, I love that Mothman movie. But, yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there that, you know, that God knows everybody thinks that there's a, there's plenty in this and planet earth that we haven't figured out yet, you know, because yeah. I know everybody's thinking, Oh, let's go to Mars. And it's like, Oh, there's plenty to explore here. Believe me. I, I only recently discovered um, the, the um, what's it called? The uh, fan meter visitor. Are you familiar with that one? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, somehow or another, all these years, isn't that, that, that one slipped by me. So let me tell you something that is, and that's, it almost makes you want to think um, that that was like, you know, when you hear about the, like a portal, like a rip, like it, it opened, it was there. Mm -hmm. And then that was it. People saw right. it, everybody, the witnesses, yeah. everything. And then that's it. Yeah. In the story. Yeah. Yeah. And the story. And so it's very Mothman-like too. In yes. And yes, some, some similarities, but, but also kind of pterodactyl-like as well, like a Thunderbird. Yes. So I don't know. And from what I understand, they have like the upstanding citizens of the town, everybody, like people, like they're, that, that they, they could vouch like I'm telling the truth. I'm a truthful yeah, person. I think like the mayor and a and a bank president yes, and people yes. like that that everyone looked up to in the town. Why would they make that up? You know, yes, that would, they exactly. Would, they'd, be, they'd be you know they they'd be buffoons you know to do this something like yes. that. So I don't know. Yes. But yeah, somehow or another that one has gotten past me all these years. And I, yes, I actually yes. uh, picked the book up. I, uh, we went to uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains in um, mm -hmm. in Georgia, and I've visited the. Bigfoot Museum there. Okay. And I picked that I picked that book up there. <laughs> yeah, but I came, I, I don't even remember where I came across it. And it was like, it was like like this one thing where all was and this was like there was no, how can I say it? there's no event, nothing that you could say no this was this brought it about. No, it would happen and then it was over and yeah, and this flying thing with a horn that shone a, a spotlight out of it. Right. And it was like it's, perched on the roof, and it was like, yeah, man, I'd be like, it's, I'm it's, moving. I mean that's it's really weird. It's one of the weirder ones I've ever I've ever read about. So. Yeah, it's like it's just right up my alley. It'd be like one of those, you know. But it's like everything I tell everybody because and the reason why I say this, like I did, I did. People, when you're the observer and you're seeing it, some you know, like in a TV or a movie, it's different to when you experience it firsthand. Then everything sure. changes. <laughs> sure. Everything yeah. Changes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we put a bit of ourselves in everything. I think like that, especially, especially if it's something that's so utter, utterly aw, awestruck, you know, you're just awestruck when you see it and there's, yes. there's, you're not really comprehending exactly what it is anyway, you know, for the moment that yes. uh, it's got to be different than what somebody else sees. Just, uh, you know, exactly. Just like, just like when we saw the, you know, the flying saucer, you know, I had a couple of my cousins, there was five of us there. And a couple of my cousins said that there were portholes. I don't remember portholes, you know, right. I can still see it in my head as clearly as I saw it then, but uh -huh. I don't see portholes. So. And this is why I tell everybody, you know, everybody, because everybody now with a camera, the phone and the proof. And I got, I go, a lot of things happen is depending on even now where things happen and you're not there prepared to record it. But once you experience that and you understand what it, you know, like you, you know, you cross off your list, it could be this, you know, all the regular stuff. Everything changes for you because even if you can never give proof to anybody, but you know you saw what you saw, okay, then everything changes for you as far as how you look at yeah. the world. Because it's it like does. because some people have the luxury of saying, Oh, that's just just like, oh, come on. Yeah, yes, because... it does. No, I, I I think even at nine years old, that that opened my mind a lot. Because mm -hmm. I, I didn't go around telling anybody about it either, by the way. We just kept it between ourselves. Yes. Um, but um, but yeah, I think it, it kind of made me feel like, wow, there's a lot going on out there that I didn't know about before. 
Yes. And then as I got a little older, as years went by, heck, it doesn't seem like anybody knows this, you know. And exactly. so, so you begin to realize that there's, there's still mystery in yes. the world. You know, there is. There's genuine mystery still in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know everything, you know. We're no, not going no, to. far from it. On the contrary. And on the contrary, we should keep our minds open. I think because. Uh, you know, some of this, so, there might be some benefit, great benefit in some of this to us as well. Yeah, of course. So you never, of you course. never know. And it doesn't, it doesn't, know, whatever it, it is, doesn't seem to be hurting us as much as we're hurting ourselves. So, well, you know what? It wouldn't be the first time that you try to explain one mystery and you get the answers for something else along the way, you know, it right. just, or, you, yeah. you know, unless you, you know, do this, then, then you realize something else and then, you know, it takes off from there. But yeah, I think, uh, uh, for my podcast listeners, Martin, what is your website so that they could, if they need to find you? Um, actually, I don't have a website, uh, but they can find me on uh, uh, on Facebook. It's easy to okay. find me. Just type in Martin Powell. And, um, and there are several there. Martin Powells, but but mine will be pretty obvious when you see it. You'll have those yeah. heads back there. I'm only kidding. <laughs> and, uh, I, love, I love those things. I'm telling you, I love them. You'll see stuff it. like that. Mostly you'll see, see uh, uh, Lucy and, and Bookie are dogs. But um, okay. um, and also I've, I've got an Amazon authors page. Okay. Uh, and okay. again, just type that in. It's got uh, not everything I've ever written, but what's in print currently. Most of my kids' books are on there. I've written 30 children's books as well. Wow. So um, there's a lot of stuff. I've been a busy guy over the years. <laughs> no, don't say 30 kids' books. Yeah. Wow. Let me tell you. I love, well, you know what? I, I like all books, but yeah. Let me tell you something. To me, that's like that, that as far as human beings are concerned, when you start reading as a child, it's like, that's it. And you, they, it sets you free. Yeah. It, it, I, I, Ray used to say that uh, one of the reasons why, uh, why we read fiction and write fiction is we're trying to make a world that we can really live in, that we want to live in. Sure. And uh, he said, you know, sometimes those worlds are really scary. And he said, but what the real world isn't scary, you of know. Course. So, but you know, exactly. but we want we want to pick what's scary. <laughs> yeah, and of course, you know, you can you can also you can control the ending there. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, a, a, a vampire creeping its way into your house is a lot more uh, uh, is a lot safer to think about than maybe you know the weird neighbor next door. Sure. You know, so. You know, it's just a, it's a psychological thing. I now think. that you say that, I don't know. Did you ever see? I'm sure you did. That movie Fright Night. It came out in the 80s where oh, the sure, neighbor sure. was the vampire. Oh, sure. And I, yeah. You know, and he's looking there and this guy looks like this very suave, nice neighbor. You know, and he wasn't. <laughs> no, he wasn't. It was like I to me. I love that angle because it's like, you know, you're like thinking I'm seeing stuff. That guy looks so nice and he's so toothy. But he really was toothy. But yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I have been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Martin. And I look well, thank forward you to again talking for to you again. Me. Really appreciate On it. the contrary, it's been my pleasure. Yeah, Take care. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to come back. So just yes, yes, yes. Whenever, we got to talk some more. All right. Okay. Thank you Good so night. much. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Wow. <laughs> Can you tell? I love talking to him. He was speaking my language. Yes, he was speaking my language. And 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 we're not talking here where we're talking English or anything. It's the language of of writers, of stories, of um and you know, when you let your thing, your mind, your imagination go and whoosh, let's face it, you can, you know. Unless you're bound, unless you're writing something that's nonfiction, that okay, well, then you know you got to go by the fact or what's known or whatever. When you're writing fiction or stories, or you're thinking of stories, is like, and sky's the limit. <laughs> you can make whatever you want in your world that you're creating be whatever. Yeah, you know, doesn't have to be. You you're not bound by the 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 realities of maybe Earth or current times or whatever. But yeah, I mean, let's face it. Even what we were talking about. All these old authors that were like you know, Jules Verne and Edgar Rice Burroughs and Lovecraft and all these people, you know, they stepped out of their, you know, they sometimes had the backdrop of the stories of their current world, okay? But they went places where, let's face it, it was like thought of as, you know, 
far-fetched or of course it's never could be real which in some cases some of the things they've almost foretold in a way a lot of the things that have come about um but yeah i mean yeah he we, we you know we're, we're talking here the same language that for me i'm not kidding i'm i'm fascinated with that and um all the things that we talked about which i think is you know what it 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 um you know when you especially when you uh, read about these different like sci-fi and i think that's what's missing maybe in current versions of sci-fi or maybe even horror mystery stories that even then <clears throat> especially some of these early writers there was always a caution where <clears throat> You know, that mad scientist trope, you know, things get away from the mad scientist and disaster follows right after. But there was always that cautionary tale of these stories. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, look what happened. Uh, all these things. That's not missing. And like sometimes it's like, you know, doing things in science just because you can. And I sometimes I don't think that that ends up good. There's things that, you know what, that even if you say we could, but should we? No. And the problem is there's always somebody in the group or more that blow past that. Should we point like, should we know? We don't I forget it. We can do it. Let's well, we don't know what will come of it. Well, we'll figure it out when we get there. You know, and I think that that's, that's something that missing sometimes in modern perspective, I'm all for science and, you know, research and I, I get it. I get it. I understand. But I think there's, there's always a point where you could say, we probably could do this, but if we did X, Y, and Z, and maybe even beyond X, Y, and Z and other things, this is what we think might happen, which might be adverse, but there might be stuff that even we can't anticipate, that X factor, that unknown. And it's like, you know, and then once we're there, especially if it's something that we couldn't anticipate would come of this, whatever this is, this research or this, whatever, when, what, in other words, because you could say, well, <clears throat> we could do this. And if this bad thing happens, if, if, if it happens, which we don't think it will, we know that we could do it, do this to counteract it or stop it or whatever. But what if the outcome is something you can't anticipate? It's something that happens that there's no way that you can say, well, if that happens, we'll have the solution or we'll handle it this way. And that sometimes that scares me. Even when we were talking that thing that I hadn't heard that thing about making dinosaurs out of chickens, like what for? What for? I mean, don't get me wrong, but I, I'm, I love dinosaurs. I think, you know, like I said, my first books, when I was in the kids section of the library, were dinosaurs. And, you know, you get fascinated by them. And I learned about the Tyrannosaurus Rex and the Brontosaurus and, you know, Stegosaurus and Triceratops. And, blah, blah, blah. and as a kid, that fires up your imagination. But it's like, what was it the, from the, the Jurassic Park? They had their moment. They had their moment. And whatever it is, whatever it was that made them go extinct, it happened. And... You don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that humans and, and, and dinosaurs, it's not, they're not meant to be coexisting. They're not. They're not. Plus, I agree with him. Some things, some, I think that when you tweak genetically any type of whatever it is, humans included, you... I don't know. A million things could go wrong. Even the quality of the reproduction is not the same. There's no such thing as the original as in produced in utero, kind of like whether it's a human or an animal or a, a chicken with the egg kind of deal. That's the original. That's the best. All right. And I don't know. Sometimes that worries me because I think somebody who doesn't have any type of ethics will not stop. You know, especially after we've discovered like the DNA and uh, all the genetics and the CRISPR and all these things that we have on hand that we could modify genetics. And, you know, and there's, there'll be people that will say, well, 
maybe we could do research where we're going to help maybe with genetic uh, abnormalities or diseases and whatever. Fill in the dot. My, my concern is that a lot of these things, and I've mentioned this before, always start out with good intentions. And then either by design or by accident, they become something else, especially if there's money to be made, let's face it, um, where all of a sudden it's not done just for, oh, you know, we're trying to resolve this genetic problem or let's say this illness, this disease that is created on a genetic level, you know, that then, and I hate to say it, like, what is it? They say, follow the money. There's money to be made and there's always money to be made with this type of research that somebody will do stuff that they shouldn't with that, you know, modify humans, you know, like the $6 million man, faster, better, whatever. And all of a sudden it's like, yeah, you know, those, those regular people, you know, the ones that were, you know, grown in a womb. Nah, that's like, we will get like the super soldier kind of deal. I know I'm going like, I'm doing my sci-fi version of things, but yeah, it's always a possibility. And let's face it. And I don't mean to sound conspiracy kind of, but you know how they say what you hear about whatever, what's being done in laboratories um, are years in advance. <laughs> By the time you hear about it, it's commonplace. You know, same thing you know, the cloning or anything like that, like what he was talking about, like, you know, reactivating and making it, it to me, it's like, almost like whoever's trying to do that is coming back to what I was saying, doing it because I want to prove I can. Almost like the Frankenstein thing. He wanted to be God. He wanted to make life out of dead, a dead body. And then he figured out it wasn't such a hot thing to be God when you produce something like that, all right? Yeah, then of course the unwanted Frankenstein monster is like, then what do you do? That's that's the thing, once, once the genie's out of the bottle, how do you get the genie back in? And we, by extension, the rest of humanity, we pay the price because sometimes those things get out of control in a lot of different ways, a lot of different ways. You know, science is a wonderful thing, but there's times that it's not to our benefit, but on to happier subjects. Please come back. I have a lot of great guests lined up for 2024. As a matter of fact, soon I will be going into season 16, season 16 of Stories of the Supernatural and go to mppelliser.com. You're going to find my website there, miamigoschronicles.com. All, all of them have links to either my Substack uh, article newsletter uh, you can also have links to the podcast versions of any of the shows, Stories of the Supernatural, uh, Nightshade Diary, uh, Supernatural Storytime. Like I said, you want to listen to it without commercial interruptions. You can listen to it on your browser. You can click on the link and you can hear it on the browser or download the MP3 file if you want to. Because as you know, once you go to the podcast platforms, they're going to insert advertising in there. Sorry. So that's an alternative. But uh, yeah, I have a lot of I have a lot of interesting guests. Some people that have been here before, they're going to come back. I have new ones like Martin, which is new. Uh, like I said, it's an interesting world, and we live in interesting times, right? And that's the thing about interesting. Interesting doesn't always mean good. Sometimes it's frightening or bad or like. But interesting is interesting. So till next time, thank you so much for coming back every week. Until next time, take care.